All right, well, we'll say good afternoon and welcome to the 2024 National Hurricane Conference Amateur Radio Workshop and Disaster Communications Discussion today. We have a, a great lineup on, here on the agenda. Um, first, um, we'll start off with uh, John Cangiolosi from uh, the National Hurricane Center. He's going to give a kind of review of the past season. Um, regrettably, Bob Robichaud, who's been at like every one of our workshops uh, since uh, the early 2010s, uh, couldn't make it this year, but we have a short video from him to kind of go through the future season and talk a little bit about the Canadian Hurricane Center, because believe it or not, um, the Canadian Maritimes have been a bit of a hurricane alley in the last few years. They've had probably just as many tropical system to post-tropical hybrid impacts as uh, um, here in Florida. So um, Bob will talk a little bit about that. We'll have Julio Rapol for the uh, amateur radio station at the National Hurricane Center, WX4NHC overview. We've got Bobby Graves for the uh, Hurricane uh, WatchNet overview. We'll take a break and then um, I'll present um, on the VOIP Hurricane Net and talk about best practices for in Skywarn for tropical systems because we shouldn't just be active for hurricanes. We can help out in tropical storms and in remnant tropical system situations that are uh, can also be as impactful as some of the bigger storms. Um, from there, we'll have a talk on the Salvation uh, Army Team Emergency Radio Network, a, a quick video overview there. We have Josh Johnston from ARL headquarters who will talk about um, updates on Aries and the ARL. And then we have a personal story from K1CE Rick Palm who writes our Aries e-letter and he'll talk us through his experience during Hurricane Idalia. And then we'll have a moderated Q&A and then door prizes for those in the room. So apologies to our folks on the live stream. Uh, you have to be present to win the uh, door prizes. So just a quick overview of the agenda. And uh, I'll just queue up uh, John's presentation here. And All right, and here we go. We got his presentation up. So again, I'll introduce John Cangiolosi. He's going to talk through the summary of the hurricane season. He's one of the uh, hurricane specialists at the National Hurricane Center. John. All right, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Hello on the line. So I'm, again, I'm John Cangiolosi. I'm one of the senior hurricane specialists at the National Hurricane Center. Uh, show of hands, anybody been to the National Hurricane Center here? So a bunch of you guys. Now, the reality is, I first want to thank you for everything you do, because the reality is that the data that's provided in real time is so beneficial to us assessing what's happening on the ground. We really need that information. And then secondly, it helps us again in post-analysis when we have to reestablish what happens for the record. about what we think is coming this year, we can do that too. I'm happy to take questions. And if there's really anything you want to know about the hurricane forecast program in general, I'm really here to answer any questions you guys might have. So some of this was mentioned at the general session yesterday, but we can talk about it in more Simulated cyclone energy, anyone ever hear that term? Okay, so it's like one or two. And all that is is a metric of how long lived the storms were, how strong they were, and the realities and how long they lasted, and that was about 20% above the average. The reason that number is more meaningful is we can get an inflated number of storms that just last a day or two but are unconsequential. That ACE number is way more meaningful, especially to meteorologists. All right, so of the storms we had, there was a lot of impacts. Um, and of course, this is where you all come in. So Brett affected the Windward Islands as a tropical storm. Franklin affected Hispaniola also as a tropical storm. Harold went into Texas as a tropical storm. Idalia was the big one of the year, it was a major hurricane in this state in the Big Bend area, and also for Cuba. Lee was a hurricane, believe it or not, way up in New England, as mentioned. Atlantic Canada has been a hotspot for hurricanes, strangely enough. 
Ophelia was almost a hurricane that went into the Carolinas, and Philippe and Tammy were both tropical storms that went through the Leeward Islands. So you can see there were a bunch of consequences from 2023. Now in the Pacific, which we care about too, this was actually even more active. Not in terms of the total number. There were 17 storms, we had 20 in the Atlantic, but these were more consequential. There were 10 hurricanes and eight of them were major hurricanes. And that eight number is really important because that's double of what we normally see and Mexico had significant impacts. There were three hurricanes that made landfall in, in that country. Lydia, Norma, and then Otis being the big one for Acapulco. We'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. And there were three additional tropical storms that made landfall. Hillary that actually made it all the way into Southern California, Max and Beatrice, all of that intensity. All right, so the biggest consequence, the statistic that we don't like sharing every year, something we want to do something about, what were the fatalities? What storms caused them? What happened exactly? So for Idalia, we lost eight people directly due to the storm. And guess what? All eight were due to surf and rip currents. None of them due to wind or storm surge or tornadoes. And some of them passed away from areas nowhere near the track, but still associated with this wind field. We lost people in New Jersey and in Delaware that decided, hey, it's a pretty nice day out. I'm going to go surfing or get out in the water. And we lost, we lost them. And to be honest with you, one of the concerning factors we've seen with fatalities in the last several years is we're losing more people due to the surf conditions and indirectly due to carbon monoxide poisoning. That's actually surpassing direct influences from wind or storm surge in the last handful of years. There were, two, there were uh, four additional indirect fatalities due to a combination of vehicle accidents and cleanup and things like that. For Lee, there were three direct fatalities. Again, two were for surf and rip currents and one directly from the wind in Maine. And for Hillary, there was one fatality due to freshwater flooding in Southern California. But again, the statistic for 2023 is 83% of the fatalities directly from hurricanes last year was due to surf and rip currents. So there's just more education needed, not only on our end, but on everyone's end to do better here. This has been a lingering issue that we've seen. All right, I'm not sure how aware you are, but the Hurricane Center grades themselves every year. Uh, in fact, it's a part of my job to put out Hurricane Center's report card, so to speak. And we're not super proud of our result in 2023. And I want to explain kind of what went right and what went wrong. And if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. So please don't be shy. And we definitely accept criticism. We're here to try to do better. So here's the first layer of our report card. Just look at the graph. The blue line represents our track error average together for all of the storms in the Atlantic. And if you look at the left side, you'll see, all right, the number starts off pretty small, but then it gets bigger with time. And that's not unusual, right? The farther out in time we're trying to make a prediction, the more uncertain it is, the bigger the error generally is. And the errors went up by about 40 nautical miles a day, so roughly 50 statute miles a day. If you look in the track error column in the table, none of the numbers are highlighted in green. There were no records broken. Now, switching gears and looking at the orange line, that represents our intensity errors. How far off were we for the entire year averaged together? The numbers there were pretty good. We only broke one record. Our own report card was at the short time period of 12 hours. No other records broken, but the numbers are pretty low. The hurricane center is generally off by about a category, and most of those numbers are smaller than a category. So that's pretty successful. Now, our biggest storm problem for the year, anybody remember the storms last year? Okay, what do you think the hardest storm was for us to predict last year? You got, if you remember the storms, give me, give me one. Otis. Otis, okay, that was a tough one. Not the hardest, but tough, toughest for intensity. Give me the toughest for track. Anybody kind of remember any? Probably something you're not even thinking about. Lee was okay. I'll show you that in a minute. I got a few examples. The hardest one was Philippe. You don't remember that one, do you? And I don't blame you because it didn't affect a lot of people. But we treat all storms. We're trying to get them all right, regardless of their consequence. If we just take Philippe out and pretend it never existed, our error goes from the solid blue line to the dashed one. That would be a reduction of about 20 to 25%, which is a lot. We had 20 storms. That's just one of them. You take that out and the error goes down that much. 
So I want to talk about what happened with the storm and what could we do better on our end. So that's what this graphic shows. Take a look on the left first. That, the, see the red symbols? That represents what that storm actually did. That's where it traveled. So it eventually did go across the Leeward Islands and then out over the Central Atlantic. Was never a real concern for the continental United States. The individual blue lines that are all plotted there represent the, represent the forecast that we issued in real time. So you can see we started off okay. I'll kind of point to it here on the screen. Oh, you can't see it. We started off okay at the early times. It was all kind of pretty reasonable. But then later we thought Philippe was gonna turn out to sea a little sharper, it didn't happen. And then eventually we caught on and then eventually we thought it was gonna accelerate into New England and that didn't happen. Now, I wanna tell you that hurricane forecasting, we get a ton of criticism about this. It is pretty hard. I mean, we're a lot better today than we were 15, 20 years ago when I started. But the reality is there's still a lot of curveballs that are thrown our way and this was one of them. It was very connected to what, how strong we thought Philippe was going to be. So take a look at the figure on the right. The black line represents Philippe's actual strength throughout its entire lifetime. And what do you notice? If you look at this, it stays all in one sort of color code, right? The whole time it was a tropical storm. It never got to a hurricane. In fact, the whole time it was kind of flatlined. It didn't change. It bounced around 10 or 15 miles an hour difference but our forecast wasn't so great. First, we thought Philippe was gonna strengthen, then we thought it was gonna weaken, then we thought it was gonna strengthen again. The best forecast that I made the entire time was when I just thought, I don't know what this storm's gonna do. I'm just gonna hold it steady the whole next five days. And that was the best forecast I issued. So I just want to let you know that there are curveballs. Now we use a whole bunch of models. You guys have heard of the weather models, I'm sure, right? And if, if there's anything you hear in this conference, and you know, I've been teaching here the last couple, last day or two, everyone sort of has their favorite weather model. You know, they're like, oh, any, any of you know weather models? Raise your hand if you do. Okay, a few of you. So uh, how do the weather models do for this storm? Well, that's what's shown here in this graph. So you can see all of the weather models are shown, Philippe, sharply turning to the north and then eventually northeast, headed away from the Leeward Islands. So where did the storm actually go? it tracked along that black line. So if you're sitting down making a forecast, is there any way you're gonna predict Philippe to do something different than every single weather model? The point is this, is this happens every year. And every year we're told that my model's the best, this is amazing, but every year we can find cases where there's just everything fails. And there's still a need for a human to get involved and interact. And we beat the weather models. We're not proud of our prediction. We beat these weather models. But the reality was it still wasn't a great service. So in our discussions, here's how we were trying to message this complexity. We kept saying, we're not sure. Over and over again, we mentioned we're uncertain. Our confidence is low. And we said that 58 times in our tropical cyclone discussions. That's how hard this case was. This case could happen near the United States. There's no reason this happens geographically. The reason I'm telling you this is this could happen anywhere that you're, in, you're interested in. So, and this, this is one of those complexities. So this was our biggest loss of the season. So I wanna move on to some of the bigger wins. All right, so let's talk about Hillary. Now, if you remember the storm, this was really unusual. We had a storm that was, it was a category four at one point, and it was set to go to Southern California. It was all over the media. Oh, and it was like the apocalypse. This is already people were changing to climate change. And by the way, I'm not saying there isn't climate change, but you can't mix scales. We can't look at an individual storm and compare it to something large scale like climate. There was the track. The red line represents where it went. The blue lines represent our forecast. Take a look on the right. You can't argue that those forecasts aren't good. I mean, those were on the money. Days and days, we had good anticipation that Hillary was gonna go to Southern California, and indeed it did actually caused much more damage in Baja, California, where it was a lot stronger. But they did get some rain and wind, and again, one fatality in Southern California. On the left represents our intensity forecast. And I'll call this mostly a success. You could see Hillary went up to a category four, and you could see our blue lines. We knew Hillary was gonna strengthen, but we didn't quite get the timing right. You could see we predicted it to reach its peak a little later, and then it weakens a little faster than we thought too. But predicting this evolution, I'll tell you, five or 10, 15 years ago, we would have never been able to do that, for example. So it really does show the progress in this field. 
All right, one closer to home. Let's look at Idalia. So here is the prediction for Idalia over and over again. The red line, the red symbols represent where Idalia went. This looks really great too. Our forecasts were very consistent. Those that were interested in the landfall spot, that only changed by 75 miles across its track. So we kept painting the Big Bend over and over again. This is going to the Big Bend. This is going to the Big Bend. We got media call after media call in operations. Is this going to go to the right like Ian did? Because that's what Ian did. It was going to Tampa, right? Our prediction. And then it slid to the right. And we kept saying, no, this is a different setup. We, I got actually students to check biases because the, we had accusations that we don't handle these types of tracks right. Ian was a tough case. But we, we nailed Idalia. This was really very much on the money. And looking at Idalia's strength, this was our predictions for its intensity. And you can see this is pretty well captured too. Maybe some of the early forecasts were a little too low, but later on we predicted it to strengthen sharply, and then we predicted it to weaken sharply, and all of that panned out pretty well. We captured the peak right, we captured the landfall intensity in Florida, generally right. So the messaging here was on point. And what I'm trying to get through to you guys is that every case is different. And when we teach people, it's really hard to know, are we gonna give you very good and accurate information like we are for Idalia, or are we gonna put out information like Philippe? And we just don't know that with a lot of lead time, unfortunately. All right, so here's Lee, you brought this up. So Lee was part win, part loss. So here's the win. So on the left, look at the track forecasts. Those look great. Very tight, didn't really move it. Over and over again, predicting a strange track for this to turn sharply northward and go into coastal Maine and Atlantic Canada as a really significant storm. And that is what happened. Um, th there was one model that did actually better than us, and that was the GFS, the American model. That was its win for the year. It was a pretty bad model last year, but it did well for this one. And if you're curious how we figure out where to put these tracks and intensities, there's a lot of experience and human intervention. There's, we don't have like a computer algorithm that spits out the forecast. The human is actually sitting down and subjectively making those decisions. Predicting the strength of Lee was challenging, and this is part of the loss. Look how sh sharp its intensity was. Look at the black line. Look how it went up from a tropical storm to a category five hurricane in two days. Predicting that kind of rate of strengthening is really, really challenging. Now we didn't do badly. In fact, our second discussion said it is becoming a question of when and not if rapid intensification occurs with Lee. But look what happened after it touched Cat 5. That top blue line, unfortunately, is mine. That was the worst forecast issued for the storm. And Lee weakened from a Cat 5 to a Cat 2 in two days. Didn't see that one coming. And then it recovered, and the rest of it's just a little bit more easy to predict. But hurricanes, they're really unpredictable animals, the reality. And we're trying our best to chase these things. Some of them are more predictable than others. Okay, I want to talk briefly about Otis, because this was the worst one of the year in terms of impacts. So I want to illustrate how hard this can be sometimes. On the left is a satellite image of Otis at 1 a.m., central time on October 24th. At that time, that circulation, and we have the hurricane hunters look at it, they found peak winds of 50 miles an hour. Remember, it's only about a day from landfall. So you're like, all right, how bad could this be at landfall? It's 50 miles an hour. The picture on the right is at landfall, exactly 24 hours later. It was 165 miles an hour in one day. Tropical storm to a category five hurricane in one day, this is exceptional. This rate of intensification occurs about once in every 20 years. The problem here is it happened just before landfall. The reality is we see this over the ocean sometimes, and maybe it goes unrecognized, or if we make a mistake, it's not as highlighted, not as consequential, but this is about as bad as it really gets. I want to show you the real-time tools we had available to us. So kind of look at this four panel, and I know it's maybe a little hard to see, but I'll just point out what you need to know. The black line in every single one of those represents what actually happened with Otis's strength. The colored lines represent the different predictions. So the top left one is what NHC did. The right one is some models that are statistical. They're hurricane specific. The ones at the bottom left, those are also hurricane specific, but they're dynamical, meaning they're actually trying to figure out what's happening with this specific case. And the one on the right is the American GFS global model. The reality is 
there was no information from any of these models that this would happen. So anytime you hear, you hear complaints about what happens with meteorologists, realize the tools are still insu insufficient. There still needs to be improvement to actually get the level of this detail right. And even though we're not happy with our performance, it was better than all of the other models given to us. Like I was on shift during Otis and I, I remember predicting it to be a category one hurricane. I had no, no support for that at all from any of the models. It's just a really challenging thing. So speaking of Otis specifically, I wanna map how this stands with our history. So this is looking at only cases that have rapidly intensified. This is just forget every other storm. We're looking at the subset of the storms that intensify by at least 35 miles an hour in one day. So if you look at the chart on the left, that represents all of those cases that I just mentioned, all of the rapid intensif intensifying cases from 2015 to 2017. So imagine we're on shift together, we're forecasters together. Our job is to hit that black line. That's our job. That's zero error. What we actually produce for all of those cases are denoted by those red bars. So what do you see when you look at the shape of this? Every, most of it's off to the left, right? Most of it's to the left of the black line, which means we were too low. Our average error for that subset is being 22 miles an hour too low. On the right is the same philosophy, but just from 2021 to 2023. Now when you look at the shape of the data, you still see it's still too low, it's off to the left, but it's getting closer to the black line. And our average now is 13 miles an hour too low. So everything's getting better. I think if we're here in five or 10 more years and we show this similar sort of analysis, everything's going to be around the black line. This is finally seeing some progress. And I'm excited about this because if we were here in 2005, 2010, we would have told you our track predictions are getting better but we're just not making our progress with intensity predictions. That's no longer true. So this is kind of a new result over the last five or 10 years. Now, Otis was the exception. You could see where our errors were for Otis. They were off the chart bad. I mean, we thought this was gonna be a category one and it was a category five. So this is not okay. Here's how we handle this from the, in the science community. We have meetings just like this one. We're going to one in May. We went to one back in November. And we're looking at the modelers, the, the weather modelers, and saying, what happened here? You know, I mean, we, we're relying on this information. What did we miss? What happened? I'm just going to be blunt with you guys. We, we, don't, we didn't get any answers. Okay, I mean, we're, we're still waiting. But now researchers are studying this. But the problem is it takes years to actually figure this out and advance these models. And we use models from all around the world. There's some here, and there's a bunch, of course, run in the United States, but we use the Canada's model. We use, of course, the, there's two different European models that we use. Um, and they all failed. Every single one failed. That's the reality. So sure, some models are better than others, but there are some cases like Otis and Philippe where everything fails. That's just the reality. So I just want to summarize this and then I want to talk more about your observations just briefly and casually. So here are the challenges in 2023. The rapid intensification for Otis, as I just pointed out. The inconsistent model forecast for Philippe led to really large errors. But fortunately, the landfalling systems in the United States were well captured. And that was just luck. I can't tell you, we've had landfalling cases that they have been poor. Now there is an argument that we get better data near land and that sure does help. Um, but, but there are cases where sometimes there's, there's just busts there too. So that's kind of what I have for the season. Before continuing, I want to make sure I stay on time. Are there any questions about what happened last year or anything about hurricane season in general? Yeah. I It has. I mean, and if we just look back, we've definitely seen an uptick since about the mid 2010s. Now, whether that's sustainable and keeps going, I can't say that. But if we're just looking back and not forward, the trend is up. These are more frequent. It's a good question. Yeah. Yep. Category 
that was the worst storm of the year for sure. And so Maria, you're right, for Dominica it often gets forgotten because the emphasis gets put back on like Puerto Rico. But that was rapid intensification at its worst. That is just like Otis that I was saying for that year. The storm intensified so quickly. Here's what's needed for rapid intensification. I'll kind of explain it and where the state of the science is. So in order to get a storm to rapidly intensify, you need a few things. One, the, the vertical wind shear in the atmosphere needs to be very low. And, and all that means is the storm wants to grow straight up and down, but the wind shear can tilt it over left or right. So if the wind shear is low, that's, you can check that box that it's possible. Second, you need a lot of surrounding moisture. That's not usually a problem in the Caribbean. And also a lot of warm water and deep warm water, that's almost always a fixture in the Caribbean. The third thing and the last thing that's needed, and, and this is what we didn't know in Maria's case, is, is it going to develop an eye and eye wall pattern quickly? Sometimes that process takes days. Sometimes that process takes hours. And what happened in that specific case is it happened quickly. And by the time we saw it happening, it was, our forecast was poor, it was too late. And we had to issue special advisories, which is something we don't want to do, to say, we're off track, this thing's taken off. And it, it catches people off guard. We tell our emergency management community here, and this is even more true for the Caribbean region, but even here in the United States, we say, you better prepare for a category higher just in case this happens. Some of that might have to be more there. Yep. Because it was a cut right. But just it, plus it, it, it reached about the maximum intensity of what storms can reach. And we were talking, uh, some of our colleagues were in Panama last week talking to, of course, the Mexican Weather Service, and they definitely want answers for Otis. You know? And we want answers from the modeling community. And it's always being passed around who. How do we fix this problem? I can tell you that the problem is being fixed, but it's being fixed very slowly. And the problem is, it's still a problem. It's still a problem. I mean, we are better today than we were five, 10 years ago. But to say that we have this figured out is definitely a mistake. And thank you for your honesty. Appreciate it. Yeah. What are the factors that contribute to the rapid intensification, of, such as Otis or Maria? Yeah, so. And how, how well uh, equipped is the meteorological, meteorological society to detect these changes? That's a good question. Actually, we're going to talk a lot. If you're interested, we're going to talk a lot about this again tomorrow morning. But I'll kind of give you just a preview of what we're going to show with pictures. Yeah, you got it. And we'll show pictures to show this tomorrow, so if you're interested. But it, it needs some of the ingredients that I said that are large scale. So like, again, got, the water's got to be warm, generally at least 80 degrees Fahrenheit, but probably warmer than that if it's 85, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, the warmer the better. The temperatures are very correlated to how strong the storm could reach in the maximum sense. We call it maximum potential intensity. Shear's gotta be really low, moisture's gotta be high, at least 70% relative humidities. But the other factor is the storm's gotta actually be small. And it's hard to understand that because you would think that if it's large, it could actually capitalize on that surrounding. But if it's large, just the momentum takes a while for it to turn and accelerate. If it's small, if you think of something small, it could spin fast and just accelerate. So we're actually looking, we are looking for systems that have a small inner core, something with a smaller eye and a smaller eye wall. If it's expansive, that's unlikely to rapidly intensify. So we don't see rapid intensification, let's say, from North Carolina north. It's just those, those environmental factors are not usually there for that to happen. But down here in the Gulf Coast, down in the Gulf Coast, down in the Southeast US, and certainly in the Caribbean, that's the zone where we watch for it. Now, we'll share something with you. We're watching our, what we call it our probability of detection, which is exactly your question of your asking. So how often do you detect rapid intensification? It happens. We're about 40%. That's just the number we're at. Well, if, if when monitoring Otis and yep. you yourself said you never saw this coming, nope. was it small? Yes. Were the, were the, the, the water temperatures at 85 plus degrees? Did you have deep enough water? Did you have no wind shear? Did you have all of the components that you just described that would have suggested that rapid intensification could and probably will occur? And if so, how was it missed? And I'm not trying to throw no. anybody under the bus. I'm just trying to understand if, if you have all of the components, how can it be missed? Such a good question. And I love, I love the directness related to it. Yes, all that was there. And when I was on shift, all I thought about was, it doesn't have time. I was like, this is a 50 mile an hour tropical storm. It's got one day. 
Now, one of the fears we have at the Hurricane Center is we do not like forecasting rapid intensification and then we miss it. For example, we're, for, we're gonna call Lotus to a cat three and it only gets to a cat one. We hate doing that because we're developing a false, we, don't, we do not want false alarms because that's a concerning for the next one that does do it. So we only like to take those shots when our confidence is high. But your point is well taken. You're right. Nobody has time to get out of the way. No, you're exactly right. This is the worst case scenario. And our lessons learned from this, and we're looking into it. Like, we're like, what could, we obviously know we could have done better, but what went wrong? The reality was we didn't have that, we, we could have fallen back on the large scale fundamentals that I mentioned. That is meteorology 101. And all of that was there. But all of our tools said it's not gonna happen. Every single tool that we use day in, day out said, not going to happen. And we have seen all of that line up before and it still doesn't happen. So it's not a, even if those ingredients are there, it's not a slam dunk. It's ne nothing's a slam dunk. So when we had all of our tools say, no, it's not going to happen. Maybe. So we went above all of the models. So the model said it's just going to stay a tropical storm. We said, let's make this at least a cat one because of the ingredients being there. But that wasn't clearly enough. The problem for us is the confidence is not there. We've seen cases where we get the environmental large scale fundamental factors that line up and then we try to fall back on our tools, which is why, just like you're talking to me, I talk to the modeling community just like that. And I'm like, this makes us look bad. We need better information. And I'm waiting for answers. And as soon as I get them, I will, I will certainly relay them to this community. And this frustrates me a lot. And the reason it frustrates me is because we're kind of the middlemen between the science community and the applied community, the, the community that matters the most. So we need to do better here. We do. And thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm on your team. I really am. I, I know yeah. 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 I love being direct. It's great. And you're right. These are mistakes. And that's why we show them. We try to get better. And, you know, I thought, I thought honestly in real time, when I think about it, it was only about six months ago, I thought I was doing a brave thing by going above all of my tools. We, we always say, we have this saying inside the Hurricane Center, only go outside the model guidance envelope if you're willing to defend yourself in court. Because if, if, if I go to my, if my manager comes to me and I'm wrong, I better have some damn good reasons. And I had them this time. So, I'm, so I, all the models said tropical storm, I'm like, no, I gotta go higher. And I went higher, but I didn't go nearly high enough. But by the same token, yeah. if you go too much higher too many times over and over. Right, the there's the false alarms. So we gotta, you gotta take your shots. You right, so it is, a, it is a balance. And it's easier in hindsight than it is in real time, of course, but we still need to learn from these things. Yeah. So one thing I can say, those who've been in here over 20 years, those, the strides y'all made. Yeah. But they have come a long way for 20 years, I promise from 2005 on. Absolutely. Our errors today are about 50% of what they were then. So that's a lot of progress. And of course, I don't see a reason that the progress will stop. You know, and I'm not sure. I actually think we'll get more progress with things like rapid intensification in the next handful of years. And that remains lingering issues that need better model resolution. Perhaps this is where artificial intelligence could actually benefit the community. These models take six hours to run. You know, maybe with new technology, we can get multiple runs and create what we call ensembles that will signal some of this stuff for us. So there's, 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 there's reasons to be hopeful for the future. Okay, great. Am I okay on time? Okay, any other questions? Okay, anybody curious about what's happening next year? <laughs> this year? <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean, I could just talk about it briefly and, I, and, I, and I'll, put a pretty, I'll put a disclaimer that, I don't know if anyone knows Phil Klotzbach. He's from Colorado State. He puts out the seasonal predictions. He's here, you can pick his brain. He's the real expert looking forward. But I could just give you the knowledge that I know and that the general consensus in the meteorology community that's here. And feel free to pick anyone's brain. But I wish, you know, I'm, we're concerned. We're concerned for the, the lineup of potentially consequential factors. You know, the Atlantic Basin's been running warmer than normal for a while now. That's not new for 2024. It's been running, it was warmer than normal last year in 2023. But in some places it's at record warmths. Like we haven't seen it this warm. And we're not talking about climate change. So I don't wanna like, I don't wanna mix scales. You know, one of the problems we have in our 
society is that, you know, there's, there's a difference between what we're saying is happening like this year and what's happening in 50 years or 100 years. We're only looking off ahead months, not years. Um, and we're switching to La Nina. So last year we were in El Nino, which is, if you haven't heard of these terms, they're, they're, they're global cycles, specifically dominated in the Pacific, and they affect sea surface temperature in the Pacific, the equatorial Pacific. And believe it or not, changes in the temperatures along the equator in the Pacific has consequences for the entire world. It's sort of the ripple effect, where if you just mess with something here, it causes uh, some other problem way down there. So I want you to think of it that way. Now, when we were in El Nino, that pattern generally causes stronger wind shear in the Atlantic and keeps hurricanes suppressed. And we did get that last year. I mean, it may not feel like it, but it was running about average to just a little bit above average. And that was a negating factor compared to the record warmth. So they almost canceled out last year. What's happening this year is we switched phase to La Nina and the La Nina is actually strengthening. And what that does is it lowers wind shear in the Atlantic. And when you have a problem of already record warm temperatures and low wind shear in the Atlantic, you have ingredients that are lining up that just don't look good. Now, we don't know where they're going to go, and we, you know, generally we can get a sense of that one at a time or even weeks at a time, but there might be more bullets in the gun, is what I'm trying to say. So, and you know, one of the things we have to do as a community is we take them one at a time, we're all in this together, but the reality is, you know, this year there's reasons to be a little bit more concerned. And that's kind of where we're at. And I don't want to deliver bad news, and I can't see the future. I'm just looking at the large-scale factors that we can see from today. And that's kind of where we're at. OK, any questions about that? Yeah. I, I do have one question. Yeah. I ran into Wall Street Journal. Not sure if this is even vetted information. Sure. But is there a greater prediction for monsoons in Africa that they think will keep down the amount of dust that will end up in the that is such a good question. It, it, I mean, that, that has been active research, so you're right. So if, if, if those that don't know what he's talking about, so the factor is from the Sahara Desert, there's, there's a lot of dust that comes off. It's, we actually nickname it Sal, Saharan air layer is what we call it. And when there's the Saharan air layer that comes across the Atlantic, storms that intersect with this dry, dusty air typically hiccup. It's not going to call them to fall apart, but it generally slows their intensification process down. So the Sahar Saharan air layer reaches a peak in June and July, which doesn't exactly intersect with the peak of the hurricane season, unfortunately. So that's why part of the reason why June and July are not as favorable for hurricane development is because of the drier air. But conflicting that is the monsoon in Africa. So there's a broad scale southwesterly flow or a monsoon trough that moves into Africa. And that is obviously going to affect how much dust comes off into the Atlantic. So the idea is, and this has been an active research of the correlation between the two, and the scientists, science community is kind of mixed on it. Um, the reality is it's like, well, obviously, if it's wetter in Africa, then there will be maybe less dust and there will be maybe more hurricanes. But the, the correlations between the two factors are kind of weak. So I wouldn't say that's the biggest factor, but it could be an added, like an added supplemental factor. And that's kind of what, what he's talking about. Okay. Well, if you're thinking of any questions, I just want to say thanks again for everything you do. The data, all of the data that's collected is amazingly beneficial. When I'm on the, the forecast floor and like Julio brings something out, we, we truly get excited because the reality is we're a bit in a vacuum. And I don't know if you can understand what I'm trying to say, but we're, we're looking at computer screens and trying to forecast and do something for people on the ground. But we are removed from that world. And we don't want to be. And this gives us a little sense of what's actually happening outside where, where we're trying to make predictions. And in real time, we don't have a ton of data, especially when it hits sparsely populated areas. Um, even when it hits populated areas, there's still, you know, the data that's not always available in real time. A lot of our conventional instruments fail. Um, lots of times when we hear like eyewitness reports about how high the water is or what the damage is like, this is so incredibly useful to us in real time to help message our information, communicate with our local emergency management, and then in post analysis, it helps us tremendously actually figure out what was happening. And I want you to know, after every single storm ends, and I don't know if you know this, we go back and revisit every single thing we did. Every, we have only a team of 10 at the Hurricane Center, that's it. And the team of 10 gets about five storms each, and for those five storms, we reanalyze all of the data, 
reanalyze what we said in real time and adjust. And yeah, we're not cheating. That's, we're not, we're, the, everything I showed you was not adjusted. The reality is we want to get the record right. And the records are important because it affects, it's the history, number one. And number two, it has consequences for insurance, which is not something we need to be concerned with about, but we need to, all of the records are dependent upon data. And the data you give us helps us get the records right. So thanks for everything. Appreciate it, guys. All right, and before uh, John leaves us, we're going to grab a, a quick picture with John, and then we'll uh, continue with the uh, presentations. Yes? You want to come up, Josh? Did, you wanted to get a picture with John, didn't you, Julio? We'll do it later. Oh, we could do it later? Okay. And I've just been told we're going to actually do that picture later. So John will join us back later for the picture. So what we'll do next is... Um, a longtime presenter who couldn't be with us um, for the conference this year due to a personal conflict, uh, Bob Robichaud, VE1MBR, has put together a short video that will show uh, to talk about some of the impacts. We talked a little bit about how we've had an interesting new Hurricane Alley in the Canadian Maritimes the last few years. And so we've done a lot of work with Bob and amateur radio operators in Canada for some of these uh, hurricane events. And, uh, I live in Massachusetts, I'm from uh, New England, and we always get nervous when we see these systems going just uh, over to the Canadian Maritimes, because shift that track about 150 miles, 200 miles or so, and it's in New England's lap. And our last landfalling hurricane in New England was Hurricane Bob in 1991. So we are a little bit overdue, so we're always watching the tropics. And I'm not even going to talk about what Josh has going on during the middle of hurricane season, but anyways. Um, let me uh, put up the video from uh, Bob Robichaud. He's going to talk again about the Canadian Hurricane Center and a little bit about the uh, future uh, hurricane season for this year. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this year's National Hurricane Conference. Uh, my name is Bob Robichaud, and I'm a meteorologist with the Canadian Hurricane Center. I'm not able to be with you this year, but I have recorded this short uh, video to uh, kind of go over what we might expect for this hurricane season. So what I'm going to cover is just give you a brief overview of what we do at the Canadian Hurricane Center. We'll look at some of the factors that influence this year's hurricane season, and um, uh, we'll look at some of the early outlooks that are already been issued for this coming season. So at the Canadian Hurricane Center, we, uh, we're not there to duplicate what they do at the National Hurricane Center in Miami, but uh, we work very closely with them. Uh, we issue track and intensity forecasts for tropical cyclones that are expected to have an impact uh, in Canada. We also work uh, very closely with the National Hurricane Center. We get on video calls when we have an approaching storm. We do some training together. We've gone down there uh, a number of times, uh, and they have come up here to uh, attend some of our sessions as well. We work very closely also with the amateur radio uh, community. We have good working relationships with the uh, WX4NHC, uh, the VOIP Hurricane Net, and the Hurricane Watch Net, uh, just to name a few, as well as our CanWarn folks here in Canada. Um, so I just wanted to kind of dive into what factors are affecting this hurricane season. Uh, the, the two that we look at a lot are wind shear in the tropical Atlantic and water temperature in the tropical Atlantic as well, because that's what uh, provides these storms with the fuel they need to, to grow to the intensity that they, um, that they can reach. Uh, so we'll start with wind shear. If we look at the profile of wind shear over the course of the year in the graphic here on the right, the shaded area is essentially uh, uh, hurricane activity throughout the year. The uh, uh, green area in here is hurricane season, which starts in June and runs till the end of November. So we see that the peak of hurricane season is typically in early September. Uh, on average, uh, if we look at all the storms in the Atlantic Basin over a long period of time, and if we look at the profile of wind shear, we tend to have more wind shear in the wintertime, but that drops off significantly as we head into the summer, bottoming out sometime in August. 
uh, and the temperature profile of the, the, the water, the sea surface temperature, that rises uh, during the summer and peaks towards the end of September. And it's right between these two peaks that we get the, the uh, statistical peak of hurricane season, which is around September 10th. So wind shear and water temperature play a significant role. Now, one of the things that we look at for, um, for wind shear is whether we have an El Nino, which is warm water in the Pacific, Pacific or a La Nina, which is cold water in the Pacific. When we have warmer water in the Pacific or an El Nino, we have more wind shear in the Atlantic, meaning typically fewer hurricanes. When we have colder water in the in the equatorial Pacific, we tend to have few uh, less wind shear in the Atlantic, and as a result, more. Uh, tropical cyclone activity in the, the Atlantic as well. So the indicator for that that we look at is water temperature in the Pacific. And in terms of water temperature in the Atlantic, that's fairly straightforward. We look at sea surface temperatures uh, and how that differs from the long-term average to give us an idea of what the activity might be. So let's start by taking a look at that. This is uh, sea surface temperature anomaly. This is um, taking you back here to May of 2022. Uh, we see that in the Pacific, the water in this rectangle here, which is generally the area that we look at, was below average. So in blue was below average, so colder than average. Whereas in the Atlantic, the water temperatures were slightly above average, but there was a large area that was pretty close to average at the start of hurricane season that year. And that in comparison to what we saw last year, we were heading towards a moderate La Nina, or El Nino last year, where the water temperatures were warmer in the uh, equatorial Pacific. But in the Atlantic, they were also warmer as well. Uh, and we actually uh, reached some record water temperatures in parts of the Atlantic last summer. So this was uh, towards uh, May of last year. If we look at the situation now, still looking at warmer water in the Pacific, but the Atlantic is, is even warmer than it was last year. This is last year. This is this year. So even warmer this year compared to the record season of last year. But there's also this little blue patch here that's starting to develop, meaning that the water in this general area is starting to cool. So we may be heading towards or at least heading out of that El Nino situation that we had last year. So if we look at the predictions for that, uh, this is <clears throat> the water predictions of water temperature anomaly. Anything in the red above 0.5 degrees is considered an El Nino. So where we are now and where we are going, all the models that we can look at are indicating that we will move, be moving out of this El Nino, which tends to... Uh, dampen hurricane activity in the Atlantic into either a neutral situation, which is between 0 0.5 and minus 0 0.5, or actually in, in a full-on La Nina by the time we reach the peak of hurricane season, which is August, September, and uh, October. Uh, that's the period that is important to look at. So if we look at the official forecast for that, uh, the official forecast issued by NOAA here in March is for 71% chance that we will be in a La Nina, meaning that that wind shear tends to be lower, allowing for more storms to develop. Now let's take a look at water temperature in the Atlantic. And again, this is where the storms get uh, their fuel. This is water temperature anomaly that I presented last year at the conference uh, in early April. Uh, there was a fairly significant area of warmer water. Uh, but if we look at where we are this year, this is as of this week, much warmer than even last year was, where last year was a very warm uh, season uh, for water temperature in the Atlantic. So looking at this another way, this is the trace of average water temperature in the entire North Atlantic between 1981 and last year, with last year being in orange, you can see just how much warmer we were in the Atlantic this year. And that spilled over into this year because if we look at where we are now, we're already warmer than what we were um, last year 
in the Atlantic. Uh, so now we have, where last year we had the two competing factors, the warm water in the Atlantic and, and the El Nino. If we head towards a uh, another La Nina situation, that would favor that we would have two things favoring a very active hurricane season. If we look at the predictions for water temperature anomaly in the Atlantic, uh, this is from our uh, seasonal model, our Canadian seasonal model. Very clear indication, strong signal of warm waters to continue in the Atlantic this year. And again, we're above uh, average, uh, even above where we were last year at this time. Another thing we look at is the uh, active phase um, of what we call the MAO. Uh, and basically what we look at um, is there are there have been periods of active and less active phases as far as hurricane activity goes in the Atlantic. Uh, we have been in an active phase now since 1995, and there are no signs that we will be uh, exiting that phase anytime soon. So if we look at all the, 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 the major factors, certainly water temperature is, is certainly a big one, and uh, we're looking at uh, potentially even record water temperatures in the Atlantic again this summer. Uh, in terms of wind shear, uh, if we certainly if we go towards that La Nina situation, um, it will definitely be an active year. And again, we're still in that Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation um, active phase. So everything points to a very active season in the Atlantic this year. Some of the predictions that have already been issued, the tropical storm risk is one that we look at. Uh, they they issued their preliminary outlook in December, and they're calling for 20 named storms, nine hurricanes. Colorado State, they come out with theirs next week. Weatherbell, which is a private company, they've uh, predicted as much as 30 named storms and 14 to 16 hurricanes. Uh, the folks in Europe that run the ECMWF model, they have an outlook that goes up to the end of September. And by that time, they have 17 named storms and nine hurricanes. And we know that when we get into these hyperactive seasons, October and early November are still active. So that those numbers would uh, add to this. And then finally, NOAA, they come out with their outlook towards the end of May. Uh, and there are about 20 to 30 agencies that uh, or companies that issue these outlooks. And you can see how all these numbers that have already been issued compared to the um, the average number of storms and hurricanes for for an average year, so I would not be surprised if some of these outlooks, as they start to to come out now over, over the next number of weeks, have some of the most aggressive uh, uh, predictions for the number of storms in the Atlantic that we've ever seen. Given that everything is lining up the way it's lining up. So the names for this year, uh, again, this is the list that we're going to use. And uh, we used this list back in 2018. That was the last time we used this list. And at that time, we had Florence and Michael that were retired. So they've been replaced by Francine and Milton. And then we also have the supplemental list that we may have to use uh, this year um, uh, that we haven't had to really uh, delve into since we've We've uh, since this list was created, but this might be the year that we have to use some of those names that replace the Greek alphabet that we used to use. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'd just like to, again, thank you for all your work and your uh, observations that we get. Sometimes you may not know how valuable your, uh, your piece of information is to us to help complete that picture of what's going on with a specific storm. So keep those reports coming in. Thank you very much for your time. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. We will see him at the uh, conference uh, uh, next year. So with that, we'll move on to our uh, next speaker and a, a personal friend of mine entering our 20th year of friendship. Um, and certainly someone that I've looked up to in our um, uh, support of the Hurricane Center and just public service and emergency communications in general. 
and I'm happy that he's still with us and hope he's, you know, the public service of the Hurricane Center, uh, amateur radio stations, 44 years, you could do another 44, right, Julio? <laughs> Anyways, but hopefully for many more years, and I'll, without further ado, I'll introduce Julio Rapol, WD4R, Assistant uh, Coordinator for the WX4NHC Amateur Radio Station. Thank you, Rob, and uh, th thank you, John, for an excellent presentation and all your support, and also uh, Canadian Bob, as we call him. And uh, basically, uh, my name's Julio Rapol. My call sign is WD4R, Whiskey Delta 4 Romeo, and I'm the amateur radio coordinator for WX4 NHC at the Hurricane Center. So my presentation is about amateur radio at the Hurricane Center. And uh, we couldn't have done all of this without the special help of uh, Rob, KD1CY, and of course, our friend Jim Palmer, who is behind all the cameras and all the technology there that's going on. And they've been with us for at least 20 years that I know of. So remember during the coronavirus pandemic, when it was so quiet in the Atlantic, well, then we had 2023, which actually was just above average. And it was actually the fourth most active Atlantic hurricane season in history. And John, you might uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I got that from somewhere. <laughs> anyway, but uh, fortunately, most of these, if you can see, ended up being fish storms. So we were very fortunate about that. And then, um, we had all of these storms come up, and the worst one, of course, there were two of them, Otis, and uh, of course, uh, Idalia as well. And they had 20 named storms, seven hurricanes, and three of them reaching uh, major hurricane strength. Hurricane Idalia made landfall in northern Florida as a major hurricane. At one point, it reached category four. And uh, our colleague Rick Palm, uh, K1CE, is going to present a firsthand report of his experience and his damages during Hurricane Idalia. And 2024, we're going to have uh, all these cyclone names, and hopefully we won't pass William, but according to some of the predictions with La Nina, uh, we may be busier than that, but. Uh, I'm very grateful we're not going into Greek names which don't follow the uh, English alphabetical order. That confused the heck out of us back when we used all the Greek names. But even after 10, 20, 30 years without a hurricane making landfall on a coastal area, it only takes one major hurricane and it'll change your life. This is Hurricane Michael in the Florida Gulf Coast in 2018. And you can see some of the damages are just completely life-changing uh, for many people. So even uh, if the hurricane season is not super active, you always have to monitor, especially the slow-moving storms that can have rapid intensification. And you can see this one here, which was Eon. So make sure you have a hurricane plan and an assistant that can help you put up your shutters Buy your supplies before the panic sets in, especially your spam. Prepare for the worst. You never know what could happen. And don't forget some of the stuff that can become very scarce when there's panic. Okay, so who we are and what do we do? Well, we started on the sixth floor of a high-rise building back in the 1980s after moving from the University of Miami across uh, the street, which was called A1A. And you'll notice we were on the sixth floor because it's the only floor that had hurricane shutters. Who would have thought that that would have protected just one floor? Well, we found out later. So in 1980, Dr. Neil Frank was interested in setting up a ham radio station because he heard that ham radio operators communicate to the Caribbean even when power goes out or telephones go out. We didn't have internet back then. So he went and called the university and says, do you have a ham radio operator there? And I just happened to be living in the UM dorm and I had a ham radio. So I would carry my ham radio in a cardboard box, cross US-1, known as A1A, and bring it to the hurricane center. And our first hurricane 
Um, you can see us there and Dr. Neil Frank hovering behind me, asking me what the heck am I doing? But anyway, we got through it and a few years later, we modernized our ham radio equipment and built a very nice communications box, which we called the Go Kit. And I explained to Dr. Frank, I said, yeah, in case the Hurricane Center is hit directly, we can take that and go, you know, and take it anywhere we need to. Well, the Go Kit weighed over 200 pounds and never went anywhere. <laughs> so, and you'll see all the wires and uh, all the uh, hurricane specialists there were always questioning, why do you need so many wires? So I had to explain to that. But then in 1992, there was a hurricane named Hurricane Andrew that hit us directly, or almost directly, uh, Category 5, and it just made a mess of the Hurricane Center in that building, which was called Gables One Tower at that time, 12-story building. So the government, with all their wisdoms, thought, well, maybe the Hurricane Center should be in a hurricane-proof building. Wouldn't that be, you know, wise to do? So in 1995, they built a hurricane proof building which can withstand a category five it has 10 inch thick steel reinforced concrete walls and there's two rooms that tw have 20 inch thick steel reinforced concrete walls that can withstand a tornado and they're called bathrooms so if you see everybody running to the bathroom you know what's headed your way so that year happened to be one of the busiest years on record as well, and we had a crew that put up seven antennas, ran several hundred feet of coax cable. Uh, since I'm very small, I was one of the volunteers that crawled under the access flooring to pull the cable through. And that was our first season at the Hurricane Center. You can see it's a fantastically designed building, and uh, you know I'm, I'm just a volunteer there and I happened to be an architect and I happened to review some of the plans that they were considering at that time and had a little bit of input and uh, it really came out very nice and uh, it's been through several hurricanes uh, that went directly over us. Katrina was one, Wilma was another one and it did very well. So we modernized from the old Yezu FT-101 tube radio that we had back in 1980 um, and now we have a more modern system which is all solid state and it's a Yaesu FT-1200 and an amplifier which runs 600 watts and 600 watts sounds like a lot but it's not too bad when you can reach all the way across the world with a wire antenna so we also use VHF and UHF radios and everybody says well that what can you get on a VHF or UHF? A couple miles, maybe? Well, we have systems set up that are linked repeaters. One is called SARNET, which is a statewide system that links, I believe, is 27 repeaters from the Florida Keys all the way up to North Florida to Tallahassee. And most of the EOCs are on there. So when there's an emergency, whether it's hurricanes or anything else, you can get on that frequency with a special tone and activate that system. We also have digital modes that we use, and one of them is our friend Rob and Jim, which do the Echo Link IRLP mode, and we also use a thing called WinLink, which is email over ham radio. So it's email that is not necessarily through the internet. It goes in tones through the atmosphere, comes down. You have a receiver that converts those tones into an email, so you print it out and a computer. To most people, it just looks like an email. But if the wires go down, the internet goes down, we can still get through. And so this is our group there. Um, we had at one time 33 operators. Um, and some of them have moved away, some of them have passed away, but and we're recruiting new uh, operators. And it's not easy to do <clears throat> because you have to have a federal background check and you have to go through special training at the Hurricane Center. So we're trying to recruit a few more people there. And you can see how we get on the air. And sometimes we have as many as three or even four operators at one time, depending on where the hurricane is and how active it is and how many reports we're get, getting in. Uh, we have been on the air since 1980. We have worked over 100 hurricanes and we have clocked 
several thousand hours of, of our time there trying to gather those reports from the surface. And uh, 2020 was a very different year. Uh, we were in the middle of the pandemic. And that was the first time ever we tried to go 100% remote. And we were concerned about that and about uh, the accuracy and the, and, 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 and the activity. And it, surprisingly enough, it was very successful. We had our operators working from their home station and were able to connect to the nets that we use, like the Hurricane Watch Net and the VOIP Net. And the other hams did the same thing. And we were able to relay all that information back to the Hurricane Center. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, I was handpicked by Dr. Neil Frank because I was the only ham in the dormitory across the street with a, with a radio I could bring. <laughs> and it was supposed to be a two-year appointment. And uh, uh, we've been there 44 years, uh, 12 Hurricane Center directors. And uh, you know, we really appreciate the Hurricane Center uh, for them welcoming welcoming all the ham radio operators. And uh, our new director, Dr. Michael Brennan, is fantastic. He uh, is a great supporter of amateur radio and he understands the importance of surface reports and how that brings in eyewitness reports and data that they can't get through other sources like Air Force Reconnaissance, Hurricane Hunters, or satellite. This time you get reports like, uh, just give you one example, uh, Hurricane Fabian through the uh, Bahamas. Uh, the hand we were talking to there had lost his weather instruments. And I remember asking him, I said, well, can you see out the window? You know, what do you see? And he came back, he says, well, I'm looking out the window down the street and three houses have floated off their foundation are in the middle of the street. I said, oh, you just had a storm surge. So those kind of things, it may not be hard data, but it gives them a picture of what's actually happening on the ground. And John, we really appreciate your support and uh, your career at the Hurricane Center. I believe you started as a specialist in 2009, so we're very grateful that you're here and that you presented and that we're part of your team. So we'll briefly, our purpose and goals to collect weather data, which we call surface reports from the affected area and, and we do that in real time. And we filter it and we give it to the hurricane specialist and that way they can see what's happening in real time. Provide backup communications for the hurricane center. I mean, it has happened a, a couple times where we were the only communications between us and like um, NWS Slidell during Katrina and some of the other ones like in Brownsville. And then we provide the hurricane advisories over ham radio, which is really through the help of the Hurricane Watch Net and the VOIP Net, to areas where they may not have internet. And uh, one good example was we had a hurricane hitting the Yucatan, and there was a Mexican ham there. And he was receiving the hurricane forecast through ham radio and relaying it to the only AM broadcast station in that area. That's the only communications they had was a little transistor AM radio, and they were getting the data first through ham radio. So there's a lot of things we do, and it's relayed, and that helps people in the affected area. And then enhancing and promoting the accuracy and availability of weather uh, data surface reports, and we encourage hams and non-hams to get weather stations, calibrate them, and send us reports. Our main mission is to help save lives. So how can ham radio operators help during hurricane season? Well, here's a, a little flow chart that shows you all the many different ways you can send a report to the hurricane center. We are in the center because we collect the reports from many different modes, frequencies, and, and different agencies and bring it down and then put them in for the hurricane specialist to review. And on our website, you'll see that we have listed our frequencies and our data modes, et cetera, in our website. And you can send things through the uh, internet as well if you're, if you're not a ham. Um, uh, we're very uh, appreciative for the Hurricane WatchNet. Um, they started back in 1965. And uh, 
the net manager, Bobby Graves, is here to give you more details of how the Hurricane Watch Net operates and how it operates with the Hurricane Center. And another important net that we use, and remember, we're, we're basically like, like the mailman. We sit there, we collect the mail, but then all of these networks, which some networks have more than 50 ham radio operators across the world, they relay the information back to us. And one of them is the VOIP net. And VOIP is a digital radio hybrid net that combines different sources of radio. And uh, it could be through Echolink, <laughs> IRLP, uh, All-Star, D-Star, I mean, they have all these different modes and we are limited in staff, limited in equipment. We have seven antennas, we can't do it all. So they do it and they collect it all and then they send us their reports. And uh, Rob uh, Macedo, KD1CY from New England, uh, is very supportive and he's gonna present a lot of detail about how they work. And just one brief example, uh, in 2004, we had Hurricane Ivan that hit the Grenada Islands, and we had a ham, his name was uh, Clem from St. Lucia, which was nearby, and we were on 40 meters, which is a short wave frequency, seven megahertz. We could not hear the islands, but he heard them. So he was on the 40 meter net in St. Lucia, took the reports, relayed it over digital radio to the VRP net who then relayed it over to us. So it was relay after relay after relay and it got here. Uh, another method is also um, APRS and CWOP which is basically amateur radio operators with weather stations and also amateur weather enthusiasts which are not hams but have a weather station connected to the internet and they can send their data to NOAA, Mesonet, and we monitor those as well. So uh, surface reports are very important, but whatever you do, we don't want you to risk your life or get injured trying to collect a wind report in the middle of a hurricane. I don't know who that fool was, but anyway. Uh, we also collect reports directly over the internet. So let's say you're a ham, you got a report uh, you know, from the Dominican Republic or something, you can enter it yourself digitally here and it's printed out directly at our station. We review it and give it to the hurricane specialist. And then we encourage everybody to download and print out the hurricane uh, surface report form. You can use it as a form, but at, the, at least you can see the format that we use to report surface reports and also what data we need. We don't just need wind reports, but it would be good to have wind, wind direction, barometric pressure, and other observations. And what is important to one person could be even more important for the hurricane. And one example was uh, one of the hurricanes that hit Mexico. We had a Mexican ham that was working at a scuba dive shop and he was right on the river and the inlet, and he reported that the water flow of the river had reversed and was starting to go upstream. And right off the bat, when the hurricane specialists saw that, they said, what's gonna happen is when that water meets the other water coming down, it's gonna be a massive flood. And in fact, it did happen, and they issued an advisory on that. Uh, other modes, uh, D star and D rats, believe it, D rats is a digital form. Um, we get some reports that are relayed to us. Now we don't have those capabilities directly here, but there are several people who monitor that and they send it to us. And of course, WinLink, which is uh, HF digital email, basically. And uh, one example was uh, 2005 Hurricane Adrian uh, when Dr. Rignab was there, we were getting these reports from a sailboat which was at harbor, and they did not have any other surface data along that area of uh, Central America. And I remember he called me and he says, can you get that sailboat to download their entire data from that weather station? So I asked for it. And that ham in that sailboat was able to do that and send it via 
HF email, WinLink, and we got that. And I'll never forget, uh, Dr. Nab called me, he says, if it weren't for that data, we may have had that hurricane landing in the wrong country. That's how important that information was, which we didn't know at the time. So can ham radio make a difference? And is ham radio too old? And uh, we, we make a lot of the hurricane advisories. You can see there after we listen for many hours and get just a handful of reports. And, but sometimes those few reports become very important as uh, Hurricane Special Stacy Store put in that advisory. So a little history, our first hurricane, Allen, 1980, hit the island of St. Lucia. And we were the only ones in contact with the islands uh, of St. Lucia. And they were damaged severely. And they had a lot of uh, medical emergencies. And they, that operator, we had one op ham operator left. Uh, went on uh, the Hurricane WatchNet and called for medical assistance. There was the British hospital ship HMS Glasgow who was nearby and says we can be there in less than a day, but we need permission from the government of St. Lucia because St. Lucia got independence from England. And so the Hamel radio operator was able to get the prime minister of St. Lucia on the radio who gave permission to the hospital ship, the British hospital ship directly. I mean, this is something that if it wasn't for ham radio, who knows what would have happened. Later on, that same hurricane hit Brownsville, uh, Texas, and the NWS office in Brownsville lost all communications. And the only communications left was ham radio, and Dr. Frank spoke with Brownsville for hours that night as it made direct landfall on Brownsville. Uh, another example is Hurricane George, 1998, when it was exiting Haiti. The eye had become a little cloudy. It was at night. Cuba was not allowing any Air Force reconnaissance or hurricane hunters over their airspace. So they didn't know exactly how the track was going to be influenced, you know, coming off of Haiti and going into Cuba. And there was a hurricane special, his name was, uh, and he was a Cuban, Lixian Avila, I don't know if you remember him, an excitable person. He came into the radio room. He says, Julio, get me the most Eastern ham radio operator in Cuba, and I wanna know what the wind's like over there. So I got on the air and I got special permission to get on a frequency, which was the Cuban civil defense frequency. And I said, we need this information. And luckily, because I told him, I said, there's no way we can pick where we, our signal lands all over the place, hundreds, thousands of miles. We can't pick a location. By coincidence, there was the Cuban ham operator in Punto Este, the most eastern city in Cuba. And he came back and he's screaming over the microphone that he's standing on his chair because there's water in his house. And he said, you know, the wind was about 80 to 100 kilometers per hour. And Lixian would say, I don't care about the strength, the direction. So I asked what the direction, and the last three words from that hand was del sur, del sur, del sur, from the south. Lixian ran out of the radio room, and I'm like, what the heck did just happen? I have no idea. Then at the 11 o'clock news, I see Max Mayfield being interviewed, and he had my report in his hand. And he said, because of this ham radio report, we know, now know that Hurricane George is not going to go south toward Guantanamo. It's going to go north of Cuba. And the track was accurate. And so in one more story, <laughs> Hurricane Michelle, uh, <clears throat> we were getting reports of flooding from the Isle of Youth in Cuba. And there was this ham who was also in the military. And I thought, I said, you know, you're sending us military radar coordinates for the eye and all that. I said, you're going to get in trouble. He says, no, I'm not going to. He didn't. I don't know how that happened, but he didn't. And he was sharing that information with the Hurricane Center because we were sharing information to everybody. Like I've said before, ham radio has no borders. We're here to help people no matter where they are. 
And so that helped with the tracking. And then after it crossed Cuba, uh, the eye had opened up on the southern part of the eye and they were gonna downgrade it. And the Met Office in the Bahamas says, we're, we're gonna stop issuing hurricane warnings. But we had a sailboat docked that had, I believe it was a Rayathon weather station on board, was sending us uh, wind reports that were still over 100 miles per hour. And Max Mayfield came in here, he says, where are you getting these reports? And I showed him, he talked to the captain of that sailboat, and then he says, he called the med office in the Bahamas and says, maintain your hurricane warnings. Because although the radar shot shows the cloud covered over and the opening of the eye in the south so showing that it's decreasing in strength, something I didn't know was the mass of the wind which may not be detected with a satellite, is still rotating fast enough to cause those winds. So that was one of the influences there. And then, of course, one of the ones I went through was 1992 Hurricane Andrew. And uh, <clears throat> I was one of the 300,000 homes that were severely, severely damaged. I lost half of the roof of my house. And then uh, we had over 200 hams in Southern Dade County that are vol were volunteering to help communications, not just with local uh, police and fire and EOC, but also with the military and coordinating uh, helicopter reconnaissance and things like that. And that was our big one and it only took one and we had no hurricanes really affected us for 30 years before that. And uh, that's something that is a landmark for S South Florida. And another big one was uh, the, the one that hit the Big Easy New Orleans, Katrina 2005, the deadliest hurricane since 1928, the Florida Okeechobee hurricane. And Katrina killed 1,833 people, mostly because of the flooding and cost $108 billion in damages. And you can see, and uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, stories about why they think that flooding happened, whether it was the levees or other factors or a combination thereof. So we were in constant communications with um, the NWS station in New Orleans and especially Slidell and headquarters had called into the hurricane center. They had lost all other communications they had no satellite communications, the satellite dishes had blown away. Um, and so they had a ham radio, one ham radio operator was there and he had battery backup and a wire antenna. And uh, we connected to him and talked to him for six hours and got live reports of wind and damage. And you can see some of the handwritten reports that we had collected there, which became important. And especially the 41 staff members there after the hurricane had passed because they were all blocked in by the fallen trees and debris and communicated to their families that they, that they were okay. <laughs> so anyway, during that time, we had a famous NBC reporter that had come in and was doing a special because he heard what Ham Radio had done. And he says, well, you guys are a bunch of dinosaurs been around for a hundred years you know don't we have anything better I'm going like well when you're in Bermuda in the middle of a category 4 hurricane go outside use your satellite phone and call me and he became a fan so uh, we had an interview that would describe some of this about us being dinosaurs with the Weather Channel, Dr. Rick Nab and Mike Bettis, who, who coin, coined a, f a phrase which I'll never forget. So I'll show you this short video here which describes why we may be dinosaurs. Well, when hurricanes knock out power, telephone lines, cell towers, sometimes going old school is the only way to get out the message. And sometimes those messages come straight from the National Hurricane Center, where they have their own radio team. And Julio Ripoll joins us right now. Uh, Julio, thanks for being with us. You know, this is a unique setup, a unique relationship setup. that amateur, a unique relationship that amateur radio operators have with the Hurricane Center. Tell us how it works. Well, uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, 
basically what we do here is we talk to other ham radio operators that are being affected by hurricanes, sometimes right in the middle of a hurricane. Uh, we use radios here, different types of radios. Some of them uh, are international radios, like we used to call them shortwave at one time. We bounce our signal off the ionosphere and it lands thousands of miles away just using enough power to power a light bulb, believe it or not. And then we gather eyewitness reports from these ham operators in the islands or on the Gulf Coast, uh, anywhere. And then we bring them in and give them to the hurricane forecasters. And sometimes that fills in those gaps that they can't get through satellites and air reconnaissance. So Julio hates Dr. Rick Nabb, it's good to see you. Now Julio and I go way back, okay? But Julio yeah, is a good Nabb, friend. Yeah. And I want, to, I want everybody to understand where you're sitting, okay? You are right next to the Hurricane Reconnaissance Office and directly yep. across the hallway from where the hurricane specialist sits. So I've had the experience of grabbing from you a piece of paper that has a ham radio report of an observation from an area that's been affected by the hurricane. We couldn't have got that observation any other way. Talk about how you work with the specialist down there. Yeah, basically that's what we do. Uh, just one example, for ex which you know very well, in 2005 Hurricane Adrian, we had a sailboat out in, near El Salvador and that sailboat was sending us weather reports from their weather station on the sailboat there, and there was no other surface data coming in at that time. And we would basically write all that down, and sometimes we print it out uh, if they're digital, because we do have digital radios as well, and we bring them into the Hurricane Center uh, with all the forecasters there, and all the hurricane specialists look at it, and then they can tell you know, where that wind, what direction the wind was coming in, the barometric pressure, and that fills in those gaps. Yeah, and, and Julio is telling the story that I, I, that was from when I had to do the report on that system, and the only way I was able to actually accurately document what happened with that system in Central America was because of data through the ham radio operators that re relayed it. Now, talk about all the volunteers and the effort that you go through to train everybody and recruit those volunteers. Yeah, we have a staff of about 30 volunteers. They're all top grade ham radio operators, and we do bring them in and interview them. Uh, they have to have, you know, background checks and personal uh, references. And then we uh, bring them in and we take about uh, two or three days of a training session, which is not radio related because they know their radios before they come in. But basically how to gather the data, how to bring it down, how to filter some of the data, and then how to interact with the hurricane specialist. Julio, are there gaps that you'd like to fill, places where you maybe like to have a little bit better coverage than you have now? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we've had uh, some missing pieces, especially in the islands. We have good relationship with the ham radio operators in the island and some of their clubs. Uh, but what happens very often, like what happens here in Miami, uh, people batten down the hatches, bring down their towers, and then we don't hear from them. So we ask the ham operators in a hurricane affected areas to have backup power, whether it's battery or a generator, and to use wire antennas, because when we use those aluminum beam antennas that are excellent when we're doing regular operating, the wire antennas are very flexible, they flex in the wind and they don't break. Uh, and we've had, in fact, here at the Hurricane Center, we have seven ham radio antennas up there. And the two main ones we use, we call dipole antennas, they're actually wires that are about, 100, about 140 feet long from our 100-foot tower down to the building. And those withstood hurricanes like Wilma a few years ago, where we had winds here, I think they were up to about 110 miles per hour gusting up there. And they lasted easily because the wind goes right through it, they flex, and with those wires, we can talk all over the world. Yeah, so Julio, I was on the operations floor during Hurricane Wilma, and I remember that event very well, and I've told the story many times. Yes, the Hurricane Center's facility is a steel-reinforced concrete bunker, but communications are vulnerable, but how is it that the ham radio signal is going to be the one that might be the last one operating, even at the Hurricane Center, if they're directly hit? Yeah, that happened uh, during Hurricane Fabian in Bermuda many years ago. Uh, they had no communications left over, you know, conventional communications. And I remember a reporter from, a very famous reporter came in here, he heard us talking to Bermuda, and he asked us how we're doing that, and I explained to him how we're bouncing the signals through the ionosphere. There's no wires connected between us and them. 
We send the signal up, it, like a mirror, it bounces it back down to Earth. And uh, he says, but this is 100-year-old technology. You guys are dinosaurs. I said, okay, <laughs> fine. I said, well, you're in Bermuda in a hurricane. Go outside with your satellite phone and call me. And, of course, then he realized, well, I really can't do that. I that said, well, these can't. These hands can. Great story. That is awesome. Hey, you might be a dinosaur, but you're not extinct. Hey, Julio, thank you so much. Great to talk to yeah. you. Thank and you very much. Maybe a lot of people just don't know. Listen, this is, yes, uh, the ionosphere helping us communicate. Such dedicated okay. volunteers. So anyway, we may be dinosaurs, but we're not yet extinct. So why do we volunteer? We volunteer because we care volunteer many hours of our time. We learn, we practice our specialized skills. And this is why all of you are here today. And we appreciate all you do to help those during a hurricane. Um, you know, we, we never know how many lives we help save, but I'm sure that we help because if we weren't there, there would be no help for them. So thank you very much for your time today. All right, so we're at uh, 3.04, so what we talked with Bobby, what we're going to do is take a short break now. We're going to come back, we'll say, at uh, 3.20 p.m. to continue the program, and we'll be starting with Bobby on the Hurricane WatchNet, and then we'll continue through uh, the rest of the program. So we'll see everybody in about 15 minutes at 3.20. Where do you want to take the picture, Julio?
All right, well, we'll say welcome back uh, for folks from the uh, break here. So basically, we, sh we shifted the Hurricane Watch Net presentation to after the break, and then we'll just go through the rest of the pr presentations from there. And uh, one of our presentations is a fairly short video, so I think we'll also make up some time here this afternoon. So with that, um, I'll start off with a quick introduction of um, our next presenter, uh, KB5HAV, Bobby Graves, Net Manager for the Hurricane Watch Net. We've had the pleasure to know uh, Bobby for the last uh, 12 years. Uh, he's done a great job with the Hurricane Watch Net, not only running the net, but collaborating with WX4NHC, collaborating with the VOIP Hurricane Net. You'll, you'll see sometimes Bobby is on that net while we're, he, activities are going on in the Hurricane Watch Net. And obviously we sometimes do the same thing with the VOIP Net, just to listen in and if we can help each other, we will. Um, we may be separate nets, but we're all in this together, working together as a team. And uh, Bobby is, uh, an amazing person who is also an extremely resilient person um, from a number of things that he's gone through. So it, we're thrilled that he's here. He missed the conference last year, and I know he was very upset about it. So it's so great to see him live today in Orlando getting ready to present on the Hurricane Watch Net. Bobby? Thank you, Rob. It's good to be back here in Orlando. Uh, I know all of us, we miss being here over the past uh, from what, 22 and uh, uh, to 2020, uh, pande pandemic really threw a curveball for all of us, but uh, it's a pleasure to be back here again. I've been with the uh, Hurricane Washington since uh, 2000. Uh, back in that day, our website was just really getting started, and uh, the net manager at that time discovered my uh, background with uh, websites and just basically handed a website over to me because it was still in development, and I finished it on out there from there. From uh, 2002 to 2006, I served as assistant manager, and from 2013 until now, I've been a uh, net manager. And uh, it's been a great pleasure to feel that capacity. I feel honored and blessed to be able to, to uh, represent our, our organization. It's hard to believe that uh, this year will be our uh, 60th season watching for and activating for any landfalling hurricanes. Well, it's also our 59th anniversary. Next year will be our uh, diamond anniversary, which uh, we're already making plans for that, uh, for some uh, special things coming up next year. Let's see if I can figure out how to use this thing here. Okay. Which button is it, Julio? Or is it on the side? Okay. There we go. Apologize for that. Uh, the Hurricane Washington was founded back in 1965 on Labor Day weekend by this gentleman here, uh, Jerry Murphy, K-8-Y-U-W. Uh, back in that day, he was actually stationed in Rhode Island when he was in the Navy, part of the uh, Navy Seabees. And he was working on the uh, Intercontinental Amateur Radio Traffic Net. Back, then, back in those days, they'd operated on 14320. Nowadays, they work on uh, 14300 in the morning. And during that net, there was a lot of activity on the frequency asking about this hurricane named Betsy. Well, the intercon net back in those days did a lot of phone patch traffic, especially uh, for the military. And it was sort of disrupting their normal flow of operations. So Jerry asked the net manager if he minded taking up everyone who was interested in this storm named Betsy up to 14325. And he would do his best to help them get the information they needed, which they were you know, curious, you know, where's this storm going? Because you got to configure, uh, you got to consider back in those days, her, uh, meteorology was still in its infancy. Um, but we started getting the information out to those people in, uh, in the Caribbean wanting to know about Betsy. And Jerry had this idea, well, maybe the forecasters could use data. What's the storm is doing? Since a lot of the mariners had uh, 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 wind speed indicators, things of that nature. Uh, so he started collecting that data and found a gentleman in the Miami area who was able to forward that data into the Hurricane Center, plus also get the latest advisories. Uh, the forecast uh, center said, please, any data you can get, we want it. So they started that exchange. And throughout the Labor Day weekend, they tracked that storm through uh, the Bahamas, southern tip of Florida, until it landed in southeast Louisiana. The resulting damage to that one storm was the first time a hurricane caused over $1 billion in damages, earning it the name a Billion Dollar Betsy. We quickly gained a formal direct, direct working relationship with the forecasters at the Hurricane Center. Back in 2014, my first trip to the uh, uh, National Hurricane Conference, 
I discovered that there is a Canadian hurricane center. And I quickly uh, uh, made uh, 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 introductions with uh, Bob Robichaud, and we quickly formed a, an alliance and working relationship. Not knowing within just a few months, we were going to be working together with Hurricane Arthur that hit the Outer Banks of North Carolina, and soon, a few days later, was hit right in the back door of uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. And amazingly, we have been working a bunch of Canadian hurricanes ever since. So uh, I'm not sure if uh, Bob wants me working with him or not. So, but it's been a great working relationship, and we've been active for every uh, 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 Atlantic Basin hurricane since 1965 including a few tropical storms. Those were either forecast to become a hurricane prior to landfall or else just never did make, become a hurricane. And we even worked a few uh, Eastern Pacific hurricanes. Our main mission is to disseminate advisories. Now people may say, Bobby, you're in the 21st century. Why are you wasting time reading your advisories on the air? Well, as Julio mentioned uh, earlier, we do so mainly for the island nations. Uh, a lot of them get their information from, from ham radio and other means, but uh, sometimes if the hurricane is uh, affecting them, we've been told that uh, one of the first things that happens is they kill the power grid uh, to those areas to, to uh, um, be prepared. And so, so uh, shortwave radio, they're able to listen to us, what we're, uh, the information we're getting. We're also there to get the uh, ground truth weather data. We forward that directly to the hurricane center. There again, you may be asking, well, you know, we're in the 21st century, why are you wasting time doing that? Well, as um, uh, uh, John mentioned earlier, is um, we need data. We need all the data we can get. Sure, we have um, uh, NOAA and uh, uh, NASA satellites that give us extremely good data, especially the newer generation satellites that actually update about every 30 seconds in high def video. But you got to consider those satellites are orbiting the Earth well over 200 miles above the surface. Forecasters are trying to figure out what's going on at the surface. We have the Hurricane Hunter aircraft that fly into, around, and above the storm, getting all kind of data, trying to figure out what's going on at the surface. We have the Doppler radar that's scanning the atmosphere, trying to figure out what's at the surface. So if we have people on, you know, ground level, they can give us weather data, don't you think the forecasters want it? Yes, they do. They want all the data they can get, and it's very vital to them. We also function as a uh, emergency communications backup for not only the Hurricane Center and the uh, Canadian Hurricane Center, but also the Coastal Weather Service offices, emergency operations centers, and storm shelters, and more. And we help provide a situational awareness to, to FEMA and anyone else who uh, is interested. And we've always worked closely with the uh, Salvation, Ar Salvation Army Saturn Net, uh, but even more so uh, since the uh, 2021 season. Uh, from time to time, we've been lucky enough to talk to the uh, hurricane hunters, either from the uh, United States Air Force or even the NOAA Hurricane Hunter aircraft. Back in the early 2000s, I had the pleasure of speaking to this gentleman on a number of occasions, Captain Dave Tennyson, November Lima 7 Mike Tango. He's been retired for a number of years. He flew one of the P-3 Orions, uh, known as uh, NOAA 43, affectionately known as Miss Piggy. The other P-3 Orion, which is NOAA 42, is known as Kermit, and they also have a, G, uh, a Gulfstream G-5 that's known as Gonzo. But uh, the P-3 Orions, including the um, uh, uh, NOAA C, um, the Air Force C-130s, when they fly in the storm, they're using all kind of data on board, but they also uh, use these tubes here called drop signs. They have a GPS in it and all kind of other weather instruments in it, and it has a little parachute that comes out, and it just floats down through the clouds, through, hopefully through the eye of the storm, and other places they put it. It's gathering all kind of weather data, relaying it back to the, uh, the uh, Hurricane Hunter, and they relay that back to the uh, Hurricane Center. However, there has been a few times where the aircraft had got bumped around a little bit. They lose some of that data to go to the Hurricane Center, and we're there to help relay that back into the Hurricane Center via HF. Our net activation policy is generally whenever a uh, hurricane is within 300 statute miles of landfall. However, that could vary due to the forward speed or intensity. Case in point, back in 2016 when we had uh, Hurricane Matthew just north of um, uh, Venezuela and Colombia, it was Sure, it was Category 5 hurricane that it stalled. So it was definitely within 300 miles of Haiti, but we held off on activation. Uh, but once it finally started moving, we were right on the uh, spot and stayed in continuous operation. Many people may remember the Hurricane Washington as being a 20-meter only net, operating only on uh, 14325. 
Back when I was the assistant manager in the 2000s, I kept begging our net manager, let's turn this thing into a 24-hour net. Hurricanes are like babies. When they want to come on land or a or baby wants to be born, they don't have no clock. When they come on shore, they're coming on shore. And we need to be there. But it always hurt me to know that, hey, uh, back in the early 2000s, uh, a 20-meter band may stay up into about 10 uh, p.m. at night, maybe as late as 1 a.m. 1 a.m. in the morning. Then all of a sudden, it's like somebody flipped a light switch. Well, the next morning we get up to operate, well, storm's already moved well inland, and it's downgraded to either a tropical storm or a tropical depression, we didn't operate. How much data did we lose? Or who was that we could help that we weren't there? So one of the first things I did when I became net manager in 2013, I turned this into a 24-hour net, started publicizing that, and I was trying to also look ahead, knowing we were getting ready to go into a deep, uh, solar minimum, meaning the 20 meter band wouldn't be good at all. And really, to be honest, if y'all, anyone who operates HF, remember 20 meters was iffy at best. If it hadn't been for us operating on 40 meters on 7268, I dare say there may not be a hurricane watching that today. But when we started publicizing that we were going to be operating around the clock, we started getting calls from FEMA, U.S. Army Mars, Air Force Mars, what can we do to help you? And some of that information really come in to help us, to help them with a lot of things that they do. So we uh, primarily operate on 20 meters during the day. We've been advertising 40 at night, but to be honest, we've been operating both bands around the clock, and it seems to be working out quite well. And uh, the only time we'll shut down on 40 meters will be in the morning time when the waterway net uh, cranks up their net, which usually lasts about an hour, maybe less, and afterwards then we're right back in operation. Our area coverage is the entire Caribbean, Central America, uh, Eastern Mexico, Eastern Canada, and the Eastern Gulf states of the United States. And if need be, we will also activate for storms in the Eastern Pacific. Um, however, that's been rare, but uh, last year we did activate twice uh, for Eastern Pacific hurricanes. Whereabouts are we located? Well, unlike most organizations where you may be in just a, a central location, we're scattered about. We have right now approximately 60 members. Um, covering 21 U.S. states and uh, uh, six countries, including uh, Bermuda, uh, uh, Canada, Honduras, Aruba, and Venezuela. And when some of our, seven of our members are fully bilingual, that has uh, been quite helpful uh, to help uh, those who are, speak Spanish only or may just feel more comfortable speaking Spanish. Uh, prior to us uh, going on a uh, recruiting program to get Spanish-speaking people, uh, really wasn't much people, many people we could help and uh, unless we could find Julio around and he wasn't always around but I know he was thankful to know when, uh, that we were uh, getting uh, uh, Spanish speaking people and um, one of our uh, uh, bilingual operators, he lives in Aruba, I got to brag on him, not only is he bilingual but he's, I don't know how he would say, but he speaks five languages. He works at the airport there in Aruba and he does all the uh, forecasting for the, uh, uh, for the airline pilots so there's some you know, most air, uh, airports, they speak English, but you know, some of the pilots, they may feel more comfortable speaking their language. So he's there to uh, help accommodate them. We work closely with the Maritime Mobile Service Net on uh, 14300, so anytime there's an active storm, we have a number of our members uh, with the Hurricane Net who are also members of the Maritime Net, so we're getting out uh, weather advisories on that frequency. Whenever we do get ready to activate, uh, we notify a lot of people in addition to the uh, daily nets that we know that are on uh, 14325 and uh, 7268, uh, we work closely with the uh, Amateur Radio Relay League uh, through their networks on email and what have you. They can uh, help us reach a number of people real quickly. Uh, through the International Amateur Radio Union Region 2, they can help us reach uh, uh, folks throughout the Caribbean and Central America. Uh, also working closely with the maritime nets of uh, the Maritime Mobile Service Net, the Waterway Net, and also there's no one there, uh, the boatwatch.org, it used to be called International Boat Watch. That's a network where using WingLink, they can reach literally hundreds of mariners in the Atlantic Basin and to know we're active. Some are commercial vessels, some are uh, non-commercial, but they can come in and listen. If they are ham, uh, licensed ham operators, they can, we can talk to them. But if there are some that may get in an emergency situation, we're there to assist them as well. I mentioned, uh, uh, FEMA, as well as Army Mars and uh, Air Force Mars, we've been working closely with them, as well as uh, the Salvation Army team, uh, Saturn Net. And we also work with um, 
uh, various amateur radio news outlets and also post a lot of information on our Facebook page. We've been working very closely with the uh, uh, ham radio station at the National Hurricane Center, WX4NAC. When they came online back in 1980, that helped us out quite a bit because back in those days, we didn't have no internet, uh, but it allowed them to get us the latest forecast advisory so we could then read that over there because they may not be able to reach a lot of areas from Miami alone where we got people throughout a lot, throughout all those, uh, most of the United States and the Caribbean, they can, you know, find, we, somebody's going to have propagation to the areas we're trying to reach. And of course, we've been working real closely with the VOIP hurricane net. And uh, as uh, Rob mentioned, uh, we're not in competition with anybody. It's just all one part of uh, one great big team of everybody trying to pull together to do one thing, help save lives. Every one of us has our own special mission and, and uh, tailored and working together uh, to do it the best of our abilities. So when is hurricane season? Well, for the Eastern Pacific is May 15th through November 30th. Uh, for the Atlantic Basin is uh, June 1st through November 30th. Um, for years, the Hurricane Center only put out uh, tropical weather outlooks uh, only in hurricane season. Well, back in 2020, since the Atlantic Basin wants to seems to want to uh, activate a little bit early, they started uh, uh, issuing uh, the outlook uh, on uh, May 15th as well for the Atlantic Basin. The peak of hurricane center, uh, hurricane season for the Atlantic is usually around the first part of September. A few years ago, actually, were, they were showing a twin, twin peak of, uh, of uh, two peaks in the middle of September, but over the past uh, 30 years, it sort of averaged outwards uh, toward the first of uh, September. Right now, we're on this far left-hand side, just getting started. A lot of folks think, well, we only have to worry about uh, tropical cyclones during hurricane season. Uh, no, they can happen any time of the year. They just haven't been more prevalent during hurricane season, but so far there's been uh, a tropical cyclone forming in every single month of the year. And if you've noticed closely with every person who's given a presentation here in this forum, or you go to any forum at this National Co Hurricane Conference, you notice that every one of us are real passionate about the work that we do. So why is the Hurricane Westnet so passionate? Well, I can tell you over the past 59 seasons, we've witnessed the power and destruction of uh, Mother Nature, and we're here to help uh, save lives. Now, I can sit here and give you a bunch of pictures of some uh, uh, historic hurricanes that have hit, and it'd be hard to tell, okay, Bobby, which one is that? Because there are major hurricanes that hit, but everything's just totally destroyed. That's common of a major hurricane. It's what we don't want to see people caught in. However, one thing I want to drive home is hurricanes are not always a coastal event. Just because it made landfall, it's not over. Case in point, 1969, Hurricane Camille, Cat 5 hurricane hit uh, Gulfport, Mississippi. Went way inland. It was a Cat 1 when it came through Jackson, Mississippi, where I lived at, at the time. We have our state capitol has a huge eagle on the top of it. Well, it spun the eagle on its perch. They had to actually come in, uh, disassemble the top of the uh, capitol building, and rebuilt the base uh, just for that eagle to set on. But that same storm eventually made over toward uh, West Virginia and Virginia, dumping a ton of rain, causing a lot of flooding in those areas, and a lot of people, uh, there was a number of people who perished just from that one storm after it made, after it went inland a good ways. 1989, Hurricane Hugo hits Charleston, South Carolina as a Cat 4 hurricane. It didn't weaken to a tropical storm until it reached the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. It didn't weaken to a depression until it reached the Great Lakes. It didn't dissipate until it reached the uh, country of Greenland. 2004, Hurricane Ivan comes across Grand Cayman Island as a Cat 5 hurricane, devastates the island. Eventually hits the United States at um, uh, Gulf Shores, Alabama and Pensacola, Florida. Did a lot of damage there. But for the next few days, it caused 100, over 120, we'll say 127 tornadoes all from uh, Florida all the way to Pennsylvania. Just a coastal event? No, they can go a long ways. Some people think, well, it's just a tropical storm. I don't have anything to worry about. 2001. Tropical Storm Allison hits Houston, Texas, drops 40 inches of rain on the city. Of course, we all remember uh, Harvey a few years ago, it dropped uh, way more than that. But just as one tropical storm, 41 people died, 
30,000 became homeless. Downtown Houston was uh, completely inundated with, with uh, flooding. Five and a half billions of dollars of damages just from that one storm. Hurricane Mitch back in 1998, at one time was a category five hurricane, made landfall as a category one, but as it moved inland, dropped to 75 inches of rain on the country. The flash flooding and mudslides was horrendous. Just in Honduras alone, 11,000 people perished. That's not including the number who are still missing, which is stopped by that same number. That's not including the thousands who perished in Nicaragua and Guatemala. Just a, land, just a landfalling storm, you know, they can move inland and cause a lot of problems. As mentioned earlier, hurricanes don't care about timelines. Uh, the storm at uh, uh, what, Otis was a, a tropical storm all the way to Cat 5 in one day. Some of the strongest storms that hit the United States uh, at, at, hit at least 150 miles per hour stronger just three days before just a tropical storm. Rapid intensification, it can happen. And going into this season here, we need to be on the, watch, on the lookout. Just because well, it was the day before making landfall, it's just a tropical storm. Don't drop your guard, people. Mother Nature loves to fool us. Here's some interesting stats that are, at least I found interesting. I didn't go uh, back further on this, but just for this uh, century alone, going back to 2000 to 2009, we had 33 landfall and hurricanes. Didn't have to worry about anything in 2006. There was no landfall and hurricanes that year. Very rare for that to happen. The last decade, 2010 to 2019, we had 27 landfall and hurricanes. 2013 was an odd year, no landfall and hurricanes. It's only happened two other times, and that was um, uh, 1982 and 1994. Now, this stat here is what really shocked me. This decade alone, we've had 23 landfall and hurricanes. Last decade, we only had 27. We've had almost as many landfall and hurricanes in four years as we did all the last decade. If this is going to be a, a busy year, we could... I don't even want to think about it. Since 2014, the Hurricane Washington has definitely been active. We've worked 16 major hurricanes, including four uh, Category 5 hurricanes. Last year, we activated our net uh, uh, four times for five hurricanes. Two of those were for uh, Eastern Pacific hurricanes, being uh, uh, Hurricane Hillary and Hurricane Norma. Of course, the big one was a, a Dahlia. People, and also what I didn't put on there is also since 2014, we've amassed well over 12,000 man hours of volunteer uh, work. As uh, asked earlier, are, are your uh, reports helpful? I dare say, yes, they are. Hurricane Keith, one of my first storms to work back in uh, 2000, I was telling Julio about this at our breakfast this morning. Uh, during that storm, I received a report uh, that the Bay of Chetamal was emptying and people were actually out there walking on the bay. And I reported that into the Hurricane Center. It didn't take all but just a few seconds for Stacy Stewart to ask, can I get on the air? And he got on there and said, look, next time people are in that area, uh, uh, report in, tell them to please get out. Get out of that bay because the water is going to return and it's not going to play around coming back in. You don't want to drown out there. And that also made into the uh, historical record. Um, even in the uh, uh, advisories, uh, even on Ivan, uh, we had reports from ham radio operators on Grand Cayman that indicate people were standing on the roofs due to the severe storm surge. Uh, during Gonzalo, uh, hit uh, Bermuda. The storm was expected to go west of the island, but uh, the storm made landfall and made, um, made the uh, uh, tropical cyclone update and, and even uh, more so in the uh, fo uh, uh, follow-up follow uh, advisory came out. M mentioning uh, landfall, I didn't put in my notes here, but you know, I'm reminded, during our nest, we'll always uh, put out this particular bulletin is that if you ever are in a hurricane and catch yourself in the eye of the storm, especially a major hurricane, I know it's just human nature. You want to step outside, see what kind of damage has happened to your property. Please don't do that because you don't know when the backside of that eye is coming. And I've even talked over the years just to make sure, to many over the years, 
uh, to make sure I'm not just pull, you know, saying something wrong. Uh, in fact, uh, the hotel I'm staying at, I, we got to chatting. He saw a, a shirt I had, had our logo on it, and he asked what, 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 I, did, what I did or what that's for, and I explained to him. He said, well, uh, well, you'll probably remember Hurricane Maria that hit Puerto Rico a few years ago. Yes, I said. I said, uh, let me ask you this. Since you were there, I said, am I wrong in saying this, that when the Ike, backside of the Ike uh, comes by, that the winds just go from zero to full speed instantly? He said, you're not lying. He said, it just goes from zero to full speed instantly. So I say that to say this. If you do that, any debris that's on the ground is going to become a projectile, and it could hurt you. Kind of like the comedian I heard years ago say, it's not that the wind is blowing, it's what the wind is blowing. So how do I prepare for a tropical cyclone? Uh, have a, first, I would say have an emergency family plan. And the handouts I've got there uh, have a, a, an example of one. Also have a basic uh, emergency supply kit. And a few years ago, uh, Dr. Rick Knapp at the hurricane conference uh, one year said, um, best thing I can tell people to do is evacuation, supplies, insurance, and strengthen your home. Uh, if you're in a hurricane-prone uh, area, know what your evacuation routes are. Uh, stock up on uh, supplies for a few days if you were to be hit. Uh, check your insurance. Make sure your home is properly insured. If you live in a flood zone area, make sure you have uh, proper fl uh, flood insurance. Don't wait to the last minute to get it because it takes, I think, 30 days before the flood insurance goes in effect. Work with your local officials. They may find ways that you can help strengthen your home to, to make it through a hurricane a lot better. Of course, stay informed. I'm sure everybody's going to stay in, uh, tuned to the news media. But if you ever want to get on the, uh, uh, on the Internet, please check out our website, hwn.org. Anytime there's an active storm, we'll have it listed at the very top of the page uh, for which uh, ever uh, basin would be in, whether it's Atlantic, Eastern Pacific, or Central Pacific. Um, you can sign up to uh, receive via email. Uh, the latest uh, tropical weather outlook or any uh, advisories that have been issued by the National Hurricane Center. Also, we have our presence on uh, Facebook and YouTube. I'm way behind on our YouTube uh, channel, so I'm hoping to start getting some uh, programming on it, or else we'll I'll just pull that link off. And also, you can uh, download the uh, same handouts I have in those folders for the uh, um, uh, emergency family plan as well as the uh, supply checklist. Anytime there is an active storm, you can go into more details. Uh, there's a little table there. It'll have uh, which storm is active, and right below it, all the different advisories that are posted by the forecasters from the Hurricane Center. That first one, forecast advisories, is mainly laid out in the format uh, for mariners to uh, understand. And also, if you have a hurricane tracking program, a lot of data that uh, is in that uh, uh, advisory as what's well used for your hurricane tracking program to help plot out the wind fields, the direction, and what have you. Public advisories is just as what you'll hear us reading on the air and what you'll even hear on the news media. Next line there is just uh, public advisories in Spanish. Then we got uh, uh, advisories for uh, aviation enthusiasts. Discussion, that's a very good product. That's the one where the forecaster gets time to go into detail explaining their mentality and their thoughts on that particular advisory of what's going on with that storm and why they're uh, uh, forecasting where it's going and what have you. And at the bottom of it, you will also find uh, something known as uh, key messages, as well as if you want to track it yourself on a, um, a paper map, we even have the uh, forecast positions there. So when we need to activate, we need you. We need reporting stations. I cannot uh, state that enough, not just for the Hurricane Washington, but for the VOIP net. We need reporting stations, um, and especially in the islands in uh, Central America. We need to, the more people we hear from, the better. Uh, you may think, well, my, my report is, you know, it's not that much. All it takes is one report that could uh, make a world of difference for that forecaster because they're looking for data and, and that one piece of the puzzle to help them understand what that storm is doing and why. Makes, if you do have a personal weather station, a lot of people are getting those these days. Make sure it's uh, properly calibrated and uh, properly installed. Now, you may not be able to get one properly installed due to um, homeowners restrictions, homeowner associations. But if you do, uh, if you are able to put one up, or some, uh, um, especially if you have an all-in-one, uh, you want to have the temperature sensors anywhere between four to six feet above the ground. I'm not talking about the roof of your house or above an asphalt driveway. I'm talking about like a grass surface or a dirt surface. 
Uh, your anemometer, your wind speed indicator. Uh, 30 feet above the surface is, is ideal, away from trees, away from buildings. I've seen some people have put it just barely above the gabled end of the roof. That doesn't work well because when wind hits a pitched surface, it wants to speed up and get over it. So you're gonna have two problems. One, you don't really know which way the wind is blowing. Next thing, it may not be the right wind speed. So even if you didn't mount it on your roof, about 10 feet above the surface would be ideal. And if you do have an all-in-one, you know, there again, 10 feet above the ground, away from uh, buildings and trees. If you do decide to evacuate and you happen to have a uh, go kit, um, if you go to a storm shelter, please ask if you can uh, set your station up. And if you are able to, uh, please check in with us. Uh, if you're able to give us a weather report, we'd love that. And if you do have a situation where um, it is to uh, forward any uh, health and welfare traffic from people who are in those uh, help, uh, shelters, we're there to help you with that. If you get in a bind and need some help, we can relay that traffic as well. The information we need, in addition to your name and location, we're looking for wind speed, wind direction, whether it's uh, measured or estimated. If you do have an uh, anemometer, let us know the height and location of it, barometric pressure, uh, rainfall, how much over X amount of time uh, on that rainfall. If done safely, uh, storm surge and any damage. If you happen to have, uh, don't have a, a, a personal weather station at your lo location, still we'd love to get the estimated uh, information you have. But also if you happen to have a friend uh, who's a ham but doesn't have HF capability, but they have a VHF or UHF and they do have a personal weather station, see if you can get their information and relay that into us, we'd definitely appreciate it as well. And if you don't know how to estimate wind speed, on our website on any uh, page on the left side of the navigation bar, we have a link called Beaufort Wind Scale. It gives a lot of good information. And give, it helps you give pretty doggone uh, accurate wind speed uh, measurements. Last year, we were just, as I mentioned earlier, we're just above average on the number of named storms. At the end of last year, Tropical Storm Research at TSR, they're a group out of uh, Great Britain. They started looking ahead and started seeing this possible El Nino coming. Not El Nino, La Nina, let me correct that. And they started thinking, hmm, it could get busy. So they started forecasting 20 named storms, nine hurricanes, for them to become Cat 3 or stronger. Dr. Bill Gray will give in his uh, uh, forecast next week. How much will it be? We don't know. There again, will this La Nina develop? Will it not? No matter what, we don't need to drop our guard. We always say, how back in a season B? Just remember, it only takes one landfall and hurricane to make for a bad year. Can I remind people of 92 with Hurricane Andrew? But we didn't think it'd get any worse than 2005, which is now the second most busiest year on record. Uh, at that time, it was just the busiest year on record. It had 28 named storms. But then Mother Nature loves to outdo herself and repeat herself. Then we had 2020. That is now the busiest storm on record. I don't have it on, on the slide there, but the next year, 2021, was the third busiest, and then last year was the fourth busiest. What will this year be? We've already seen that this decade has already been busy. So bottom line, never let your guard down. These storms can change track on you. This is the path of uh, Hurricane Betsy back in 1965. That storm changed track two times. Mother Nature loves to repeat herself from time to time. Back in 85, Hurricane Atlanta came across Cuba and looked like it was going to head straight towards the Mississippi Gulf Coast. It gets out in the middle of the Gulf, makes a right hook going towards Tampa, or it looked like maybe Tampa. And then all of a sudden it does a 180 does degree turn and comes right back and hits Gulf Fort, Mississippi as a Category 3 hurricane. Bottom line, stay informed, the time to prepare is now. And please never drop your guard when it comes to Mother Nature. She loves to trick us and fool us. Um, as uh, John from the Hurricane Center has already alluded to, it even tr she tricks them from time to time. So uh, it's not an exact science, and we're just all working together to try to help the Hurricane Center out, plus also help everyone out as well. Hurricane preparedness is all about saving lives, and that's what we're here for today. I cut my presentation short today because we knew we had a, a lot of folks uh, trying to present today, and we just cut back on our time a lot. So if anyone uh, would like, I'm available for video conferences for your group or ham radio club uh, via just about any of the uh, uh, digital uh, video medium. So uh, if, you have, uh, if you like, I'm, I'm available to uh, work with you on that. 
appreciate your time and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the uh, presentations today. Thanks a lot. All right, well, we'll thank uh, Bobby for being with us uh, and, and sure glad he was with us uh, this year to give the presentation and overview on the Hurricane Watch Net. So now what we'll do is um, I will get into the VOIP Hurricane Net. We'll get the uh, presentation up here and we will uh, uh, get started with that. And you'll see the agenda here again. So um, we have a short video on Saturn following that, the ARL update, Rick Palm's presentation on his personal account of Adalia. And then uh, we'll have a Q&A and panel and then the door prizes, but only for those here live in the room. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the VOIP Hurricane Net. I am the director of operations for the VOIP Hurricane Net and also talk a bit about some best practices in Skywarn for tropical systems because just because um, a, a tropical system is not a hurricane, it can cause big problems on that local regional level to support our local weather service offices. And we should be ready to support that mission uh, as well. So the VOIP Hurricane Net, believe it or not, has now been around for about 20 years, going back to 2004, um, founded by Kevin Anderson, KD5WX, and Danny Mustin, KD4RAA. And then of, in 2005, I became the director of operations for the net after serving as a net control in 2004. Our main mission is to provide all of that surface data to the National Hurricane Center. And we use the reporting criteria as your typical Sky One reporting criteria, measured wind gusts 40 miles per hour or greater, tree damage, wire damage, damage to structures, uh, rainfall, measured rainfall, river, stream, urban, and storm surge flooding. That's basically our, our criteria. Uh, we have the criteria posted on the VOIPWXNet website. Um, we try to liaison to various net operations that are on the various digital modes, but we've taken it one step further because there's a lot of information out there. The problem is trying to gather it all. There's lots of online weather stations out there, but which ones are right under the uh, hurricane that could provide the most valuable information? So we are trying to get folks, obviously, first and foremost, the stations in the affected area to report. But sometimes they're very busy with their local nets, their local EOCs, their shelters, their own local communications. So if we can't get to them, another way is for amateur radio operators from outside the area to pull out data from inside the affected area. And it's really important because communications can still fail, but a bigger mission for amateur radio that we must continue to execute on is that situational awareness picture for the uh, weather service, the hurricane center, uh, also, the, the, the media, state emergency management, local emergency management, et cetera, it can be critical. And we do issue out and send out the advisories and updates. What we've tried to do with that over the years is, if anyone's noticed, right, those advisories get really long. And so what we've been trying to do is read them but kind of condense them to the key points, eliminate all the safety hazard information. We can certainly read the full advisory on request, but we've actually tried to you know, it's gotten to the point where some of our nets were constantly just issuing, sending out the advisories and the warnings, and it's creating a lot of traffic that, well, the value add may be a little bit, you know, better if we condense that. So that's what we've tried to do over the years. Um, we meet on the Echolink um, Star WX Talk Conference, Node 7203, IRLP Reflector 9219 uh, system. Um, all right, we have a net management team. We do a lot of different things as a team to keep everybody uh, up to date on um, what we're doing in terms of activation status, we've also will self-activate um, as needed for an affected area, especially when you look at some of the systems like Hurricane Otis, we were thinking maybe barely a hurricane, it turned into a category five. We'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. Um, we are also there for other emergency management partner agencies if they want to use the system or want to use our resources, we're available for that uh, as well. And the network is always on and enabled, so um, it's, it's there now for use and, and um, it is an always on system so it's available uh, anytime it's needed. We're trying to get as much data as we can to Julio and the Hurricane Center using that reporting criteria that we talked about. We also can be interoperability for the EOCs, the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, the Weather Service. Uh, we've had FEMA regions on our network monitoring. 
Uh, we've had Red Cross National Headquarters on our network and monitoring. Um, we, we have a system where we can send in reports to Julio and it also has a viewer so people can see the reports that we're getting from all the different um, sources. Um, we, we try to liaison to other nets that may be uh, specifically separate nets for the local area and bring that information in. We talked about weather stations. We do look at social media, try to glean out the good information that is there that we can then share with the, all agencies along with sharing the advisories. Um, so all of that is part of our, our mission. So our activation policy, we talked through just having access to information is our activation policy. So that's what we, we do and, and try to keep active in that fashion. So our, our net management team functions, we are there monitoring the tropical weather outlooks, the special tropical weather outlooks and advisories. As things get close to land, we'll reach out to Julio if he hasn't reached out to us and say, uh, when are you planning on activation and we prepare to activate. We've had a number of systems unexpectedly intensify on us where we've had to react quickly. The latest was Otis in the Eastern Pacific and that was a real tough one. We've had challenges getting active amateur radio operators in Mexico. This thing intensified and made landfall at one o'clock in the morning Eastern time. A lot against us, but we use some of these other techniques of monitoring with social media to help bring in information. Um, we have a uh, chat using um, Telegram that we use to coordinate our net control operation efforts. And our, our net management team, uh, you know, we, we pre attempt to prepare everybody for what the hurricane season is going to bring. We usually focused on the Atlantic Basin and the Gulf of Mexico, but as we see, we've been having to be a bit more active in the Eastern Pacific, especially uh, with El Nino this past year. Um, so looking at our technical information, so it, we'll, we'll get to that here in a minute. Looking at our net, we have a, our, our VOIP hurricane prep net is on the uh, first Sunday of each month, Saturday evening in North America during the non-hurricane season months, and then we go to weekly during the hurricane season months. The uh, net provides a forum for our technical questions. Um, we have not done presentations here in the, the last few years, but we are, could, we are potentially looking at getting back into that. Our, our prep nets are kind of like just regular nets. They can run quite a bit differently than our activations. And again, our website is voipwx.net. Um, our technical information, always good to have your system audio checked. One of the big problems is on Echolink, we purposely have folks disable Echolink conferencing because it can cause unintentional interference. So if you hear that message and you get booted off the system, there, you just go into the settings and within Echolink and you can disable um, conferencing. Um, for Echolink uh, systems, we like to have folks eliminate their repeater ID, courtesy tone, and squelch tails from passing over the network. And our tech coordinator, Tony VK3JED, along with some of us within the team, can help advise you on doing that. We also can have All Star connect in through Echolink, so that's another uh, a, a system that we can um, uh, bring in and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the new technology where it allows us to bring some of the other digital modes in as well. Um, the Echolink PC software remains uh, the current uh, uh, update was as of July 1st, 2021, so hasn't been a lot of changes here um, since 2021. But one thing that is new that has changed is there's now an Echolink web app where if you're a valid amateur radio operator, you can simply um, put in your call sign and password as, that's in um, as your registered user in Echolink. You can then access um, Echolink on the web, connect to WX Talk, and you're on. So this is an actual uh, web link. It's webapp.echolink.org. It's another way to use Echolink. Relatively new. I think it basically started late 23, early 24. So it's another update that we wanted to provide folks um, that is new, that might be another good way to use Echolink if you're um, in the amateur radio community. The, the um, Echolink can also be accessed via cell phone app, and there have been updates um, from December 13th, 2023 and January 18th, 2024. We have these new revisions that are out there, so check your uh, Echolink app to make sure you're running the latest version because it may have some uh, bug fixes, et cetera, that could be uh, helpful. One of the other things through our tech coordinator, Tony, that we've done and, and we have um, haven't quite yet gotten to the point of upgrading our system to just do it directly 
is getting more modes beyond All-Star and Echolink and IRLP together. We've used Tony's system and brought it in to bring in DMR, DSTAR, NXDN, P25, M17. I think there are a bunch of others that are, can also be added. So we can bring in a lot of the digital modes, almost all of them, with the exception of um, um, some of the DMR, D, DMR mark systems. So we can have one large network. Everybody wants us to be everywhere, but as Julio pointed out, we can't be everywhere either. We try to be in as many places as we can. So bringing in all these modes into one network um, can allow us to utilize all these different modes in one place. We had done some work with Quadnet in the late 2010s. Um, in the 2020s, we've been working to kind of get this technology. First, we were bringing it in from Tony. What we're trying to do next, and didn't get to last year, and hoping to this year, is to get all these modes actually on our system directly, because we think that will help get that many more folks involved. One of the other things we as amateur radio operators should think about is can we reach non-amateurs? There's a lot of weather spotters that aren't amateur radio operators. We can try to lure them to become amateur radio operators, but maybe one way we can also do that is use the means of communication that are out there, such as Zello, some of the other um, chats and social media. Again, trying to bring in all the resources of data in one place. There's online public safety feeds, or there may be amateurs that can monitor their, their local police and fire, their home stations. Maybe they're folks that want to get involved, are good operators, but they can't deploy to an EOC. They can't deploy to a shelter. Well, they can help from home by giving information from their location and also from these other resources. And then we can go review it, vet it, and then post it um, to the Hurricane Center if it looks valid. So these are ways we can plug in that situational awareness gap that people don't have, especially in the official agencies, to be able to monitor. We can monitor that for them. Emergency management is trying to update up to the state EOC. If they're very overwhelmed, those updates are going to be delayed. This is a way we can get the information of the Hurricane Center and other agencies. And again, in New England, that is one of the number one things they view amateur radio is the, the situational awareness uh, aspect. There's also um, a way to use Zello or Echolink or other modes with these network radios, which you always have your PC, you have it on Echolink, you have your phone, and you have Echolink, or you have Zello. It's hard to put all of this on your phone and then use it for other things. So these network radios help you sp um, spl splinter out those things into actual radios. Um, I own a couple of these radios. They're relatively inexpensive. Um, and you, know, you can have it in a handheld form or a radio. You can use it over cellular or I just use it over Wi-Fi and I can use my phone hotspot. But these are ways that we can kind of expand our communications a bit more to some of these other modes and also free up our computers for other things. So trying to be that virtual communication situational awareness hub is what we're trying to do along with the interoperability, along with providing communications when all else fails. But the situational awareness mission is something that, whether the communications are up or not, is always needed. So that's a way for us to kind of get in and be there and be ready for when things fail. A lot of folks have talked about um, the various systems over the years. I kind of just provide a table here with the last five years of activity. You'll notice we were quite active um, in the past year with even Eastern Pacific systems. We were active for Hillary because it was a hurricane across the Baja California Peninsula, but also as a tropical storm up in Southern California, which was a fairly rare event that hadn't happened since roughly the late 1930s or 1940 timeframe. We did activate there and gave information to the Hurricane Center. We'll hit a couple of these here in the last two years that were really very formidable and, and, and active. It won't be going through um, all of them. I want to mention Fiona from, la from la last year because it was really, or excuse me, 2022, because it was really a formidable system starting in Puerto Rico with wind gusts over 100 miles per hour, affected the Turks and Caicos Islands, affected Bermuda, etc. extreme rainfall over eight inches of rain. So again, this was in 2022 but it was formidable enough to mention here. This is the Turks and Case Ghost Islands uh, um, area here. Some of the, and uh, 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 Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic starting in Puerto Rico. This is some of the uh, water rescues from flooding and some of the tree damage. And then it went up into Atlantic Canada. 
and it had the most hurricane warning coverage in the Canadian Maritimes um, uh, ever since they started issuing hurricane warnings. Now that was fairly late. It was in the late 2000s that they started to be able to issue hurricane warnings up in Canada. And there were wind gusts here wet over 100 miles per hour as well. Um, other locations in Canada um, uh, through Quebec and Green Island and Newfoundland had high wind gusts over 90 miles per hour. So this was very formidable and this was some of the damage uh, both from wind damage and storm surge that we saw um, in Atlantic Canada uh, in parts of Nova Scotia. From a New England perspective, for those in the room and on the live stream there in New England, it was their kind of probably closest facsimile to the 1938 hurricane or a major hurricane that they could have. And someday that could move and, and be up into New England. Now getting back to Florida, obviously two years ago, 2022, people remember Hurricane Ian and its major impacts in Cuba through Florida and eventually as a weaker category one system in the Carolinas. But we had a lot of activity from amateurs in Florida and some of our virtual operations were, were helpful. So I got a surprising message from our local weather service office in 2022 saying, from our science officer, Joe Delacarpini saying, I'm on the virtual desk providing situational awareness to the Florida Weather Service offices. I know you do the hurricane net. If you have any reports from the hurricane net, um, please forward them to me and I will make sure the offices are situationally aware of them. So for about six hours, we were sending in reports to the Hurricane Center and giving Joe, who was the local office person, uh, happened to be in our office area, who was providing support for the other local offices in the area. So those reports were getting not only to the Hurricane Center, but making sure we were getting them to all the other local offices. So these reports down here, as high as 140 mile per hour wind gusts, 132 miles per hour, they, they were getting sent in um, to the Hurricane Center and also the local offices. We even had reports from Cuba from social media. And this was some of the uh, reports and pictures from social media. We even had a picture of a weather observer in Cuba actually doing measurements during um, Ian. So this was some of the information that we provided um, to Julio and team at the Hurricane Center. And then of course in Florida. And we had amateur operators, some of which deployed with Red Cross, that um, were down in Florida that provided some of the photos here. Uh, Emily Pike is originally from New England. She's a storm chaser and now a broadcast meteorologist up in Maine who uh, had uh, pictures of storm damage from her chase down there. And we had another amateur on social media providing some reports and pictures you know, from Cape Coral, uh, Florida area. So this was some of the information that we were able to provide. And it went all the way into the Carolinas. And, who do I hear from was one of our net um, uh, participants, NP3OD Francisco in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Well, his brother lives in Georgetown, South Carolina. This was around his house, all the flooding that we sent into the Hurricane Center. This was from the Surf City, North Carolina Police Department uh, coastal flood uh, photo from them. This was information that we forwarded. In addition to some of these weather station reports of uh, category one hurricane strength in Morris Island, South Carolina from Ian. So these are some of the things that we were forwarding on to the Hurricane Center and other agencies uh, during, uh, during this event. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about Adalia from last year. So it affected Florida but was weakening at the time of landfall. Nonetheless, several hundred thousand lost power, very rural area of Florida. One of the key reports we had was from an amateur radio operator in Key West who happened to know friends and amateur radio operators in the Perry, Florida area that gave us reports of some of the storm damage there. This was the roof being taken off of a home. Uh, Jim Cantori was down in Florida. We were feeding some information to him as well. And he mentioned, wow, there were no 100 mile per hour wind gusts in, with this hurricane, it really fell apart. And I said, oh, I don't know that that's necessarily the story here. I think the story is, is we found one of the few holes in the United States with lack of weather station observations. Not even up in Perry. There is the airport in Perry, the ASOS up there, but this is about as big of a gap as I've ever seen in online weather stations. Nothing in this area where it made landfall. And the Hurricane Center acknowledged it as well. 
and I highlighted it here. The estimated peak intensity at landfall is 100 knots, but there's some uncertainty around that value given the lack of surface data and the ongoing structural evolution of Adalia at that time. So this is a case where if we had some observ observation and ground truth in this area, would it tell a different story or would it give us the specific story of what was going on with Adalia at landfall? That's what we want to gather as an amateur radio team, whether it's direct to our amateur radio operators or extending ourselves to the non-amateur radio spotters and other resources to get that information. I can tell you that I think it, there were definitely some 100 mile per hour wind gusts. Here's some of the structural damage that occurred in Perry, Florida. And I know that our, our presenter coming up before the end of the afternoon, Rick, will, Rick Palm will have a lot to say about this, but this was some of the damage and obviously the huge tree damage, et cetera, and, and, and more structural damage. So again, gives you an idea of what was happening on the ground. We did have Hurricane uh, Lee that was, became post-tropical as it approached um, uh, the Cape and Islands, uh, Maine and the Canadian Maritimes. This was some of the isolated tree damage we had on the Cape and Islands. The key thing I want to mention with this one here, Lee wasn't as substantial in Canada uh, as Fiona was, but they did have uh, tens of thousands without power, uh, which you would expect from a borderline uh, uh, strong tropical storm, category one type of, of system. They had storm surge issues. But the thing I want to draw through here is um, we've had quite a few changes with FEMA Region 1, uh, which has included Mike Corey, KI1U, who used to be um, in Josh's role as manager or pre of preparedness and response, now as director of emergency management with Josh. He's joined FEMA Region 1, and they're already working on situational awareness, and they kind of used Lee as a test vehicle, knowing it wasn't going to be a huge problem for New England, but they kind of used it as a test vehicle to test out their communications and also, hey, send us your situational awareness information. So several of the SECs in New England, et cetera, were sending in information not only to the Hurricane Center, but also to FEMA Region 1, which was uh, kind of a good test vehicle to do that in a system that wasn't going to be overly unusual for New England, but a good way to test out, hey, tell us what you see out there, your situational awareness, use the Sky 1 reporting criteria as an original guide. So now we'll talk briefly about Otis, because this was one, it became a Category 5 hurricane. It was extremely, uh, rap it extremely rapidly intensified, as we talked about earlier. We'll show some of the damage to the hospitals and hotels and other structures, how it rapidly intensified and, and changed the, you know, it was a rapidly changing forecast. And Mexico has always been a struggle for us with direct information. So it was, what do we do? Well, I wasn't going to let it go and not have information for the Hurricane Center. Let's use our other skills to get information to the Hurricane Center. Online weather stations, as you might expect with a Category 5 hurricane, went down very quickly. Um, but we did have some information, including these are some of the damage here. And you can see, middle of the night. Uh, you can see here one of the uh, Mexican uh, civil defense resources. This was in miles per hour, basically 167 gusts to 205 miles per hour. There was also a weather station before it went offline that recorded gusts over 135 miles per hour during um, Otis in Alcapoco, Mexico, which was hardest hit. These are more of, of the damage photos. This is a, a big high-rise hotel building. And so, see the windows and such spewing across the streets. Uh, Pretty devastating uh, uh, look of things. This was, one, this, this was Otis in Alcapoco, Mexico from last year in the Eastern Pacific. So this is some of the hospital damage. There were actually videos of them moving the patients to the hallways away from the windows of the rooms because they were afraid they were going to be injured by flying debris. This was some of what happened in Alcapoco uh, during um, Otis. So that gives you a little run through of things in terms of the past year. Here's what we're doing in terms of, of our work for the coming year, trying to get Tony's technology integrated directly to our system. We are constantly looking for net controls. So if folks are interested, we'd love to get some more folks to run our regular net and for net activations. Uh, we know the Hurricane Center communications test will be coming up. We'll have details on that in early May. Try to get to some net control training and then just getting more folks 
involved in the affected area, but also trying to get folks involved outside of the affected area that maybe can help relay some of this information from some of the other sources that we mess mentioned. Getting that virtual communication, situational awareness support model out, because we'll have 80, 100 connections. And they're all people that I think want to help, but they don't necessarily know how. And so, some do, and they provide the information when they, when they have the ability to do so. But we're trying to expand that knowledge of, to the folks that connect and listen in and, and potentially want to help. So I'm going to just spend a couple minutes talking about our best practices in Skyworn for tropical systems that are below hurricane strength. Because just below, because they're below hurricane strength doesn't mean that there isn't a mission with our local National Weather Service offices, local and state emergency management, other NGOs and partner agencies, because they can have some significant impacts. Um, and systems up in New England that transition to post-tropical, they may be not as intense, but they, their impacts spread out much bigger in area. You know, we saw that with Hurricane Sandy in 2012. We've seen that with Fiona, which was kind of in that transitioning state in the Canadian Maritimes. <coughs> that is an issue that it is important, and sometimes even the Hurricane Center, the Hurricane Watch, et cetera, have been on the air for those, even when they've kind of transitioned beyond a hurricane because of the intensity and size aspects. You know, Tropical Storm Henri was a good example that affected the state of Rhode Island and to a lesser extent, southeast Massachusetts. This was a strong tropical storm. You could see it tore some shingles off the roof of this art association, some of the downed trees. These were, this was close to 80,000 were without power in Rhode Island, a much smaller number in Massachusetts focused on the um, uh, Bristol County, Massachusetts area, which actually is near where I live and I actually could find damage fairly close to my home um, during Henri. Um, so a lot of that information was forwarded to the uh, Hurricane Center and this was well appreciated by now retired hurricane specialist Stacy Stewart, who used a lot of the reports in the advisory. He also used a lot of the information um, you know, from the local office, et cetera, and, and he was thanking our amateur radio community for all of the support. So these were some of the reports from our, our Skywarn um, uh, nets feeding in through the VOIP hurricane net and then out to the hurricane center. The remnants of Ida. So this, this was a, obviously Ida was a huge category five hurricane that affected Louisiana. We certainly didn't get that in New England, but what we did get, and it was already a very wet summer, was huge amounts of rainfall. I had 8.61 inches of rain at my house. I thought that it was wrong. I had the emergency management director of my city call me and say, the wastewater treatment plant measured nine inches. I go, okay, well, my reading must be good then. So. And, and this was flooding hours after the heaviest rainfall. And we were just very lucky that we had a very short gap of about 90 minutes or our flooding would have been off the charts, um, uh, terrible, like it was in New York City and some other areas from the remnants of Ida. We also had an EF0 tornado in Dennis, a microburst in Yarmouth. So we had severe weather as well. And this was something that we had to be active for from a local regional Skywarn perspective. And then, this was a major nor'easter that quite frankly, um, if it wasn't, it was a non-tropical system at the end of the day, this actually became Wanda well after it affected New England out in the open ocean. But this was probably as close to a category one hurricane as we've had in New England. We had over 500,000 without power. We had wind gusts up to 100 miles an hour. Our Cape Cod Aries group was active for almost five days after the uh, storm. This was a serious one. We had boats kind of pushed off in the harbor, much like what you would see in, in a hurricane. This is just a small sampling of the damage, damage that we had with trees, et cetera. And you know, there was an article posted by the league. This was a very tough system. We had high wind warnings, not hurricane warnings, et cetera. This was a very potent system for us to, to deal with, um, even though it wasn't a hurricane. So we want fo folks to remember, you know, have your home preparations complete. Make sure you have, if, once that's complete, you know, don't assume the media or whatever has it covered and agencies are all set. You know, take advantage of performing that situational awareness mission, do Skywarn nets, get information out and be that force multiplier to bring that information forward. And then if communications surprisingly go down maybe, because it's not a hurricane, you're just in that much more position to be able to help. These are a bunch of links of our 
of, of learning more about IRLP and Echolink and our website and our social media presence, our group's I.O. list. Um, this will be very helpful uh, for those um, that want to get more interested in the net. Also, if you have technical questions, our team can, can help with that as well. Um, so here's some of our contact information of some of our net management team here. Um, so um, welcome to contact any of us if you want to get more involved, whether it's as a net participant or um, as a net control, et cetera, or during, you know, trying to help with that situational awareness mission, we can definitely uh, get help from folks. And then my last slide, I, 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 I got a chuckle out of Josh, so this is good. So this is a photo of our last, um, well, technically three out of four, but we'll say kind of the last three folks that have been in the ARL headquarters, um, manager of preparedness and response, and now under Josh, director of emergency management position. This is Dennis Dura, K2DCD, who is on our, our VOIP hurricane net management team. Um, KI1U, Mike Corey, who was our previous manager of preparedness and response. He's at FEMA 1 Emergency Communications, doing a great job integrating amateur radio into the work of FEMA Region 1, um, including the uh, RECWIG, et cetera. And then Josh, our current director of emergency management, who you will be hearing from a little bit later after a short video on Saturn. So that's uh, it on the VOIP hurricane net. Um, we'll take questions at the end. And what I'll do now is I'll move us on to a, a short video on Saturn, and then we'll uh, bring uh, Josh up from here. So we'll get that video started right now. Okay. Tell me when you're ready, Jim. Hello team, my name is Joe Bassett and I am the Southern Territory Saturn Assistant Coordinator for Operations. Uh, really that big long title just means that I do what Bill Feast tells me to do. And Bill and I had both wanted to be with you, but we were unable to, so he said, Joe, do a video for them so that we can bring them up to speed on how Saturn contributed to hurricane efforts last year and also what we can look, to, look forward to in the season that is just about upon us. You may not be familiar with the Salvation Army as a church, but that is primarily what it is. In their mission statement, they say they are an evangelical part of the Universal Christian Church. Really what this means is that the Salvation Army's relief efforts, their social services, are driven by a love for God and a hand to man. The Salvation Army in the United States is separated into four territories. Uh, the Eastern, Southern, Central, and Western. These territories work by and large autonomously. They will cooperate with each other, but they operate on their own with some protocols that are unique to each area, and this is coordinated by a national headquarters, which really does not have authority over the other territories, but can strongly encourage them uh, when they need to work together and cooperate. Territories are separated into divisions. I've demonstrated here the Southern Territory, um, where you can see that there are divisions, and sometimes the divisions are independent states, such as Texas or Florida. Sometimes divisions are comprised of multiple states, such as you have with Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi. These divisions are under the authority of their territorial headquarters, for the South Territorial Headquarters is in Georgia. And Territorial Headquarters is where you'd see scalability in the divisions working together. The Salvation Army is more than just social or disaster services organization. As I said, it's a church and it provides essential community programs. As a church, the denomination, they're called Salvationists. The local church is referred to as a core. The pastors and clergy are called officers, keeping with that military uh, background or that military framework under which they work. Uh, you see there I've placed the red epaulet there. You can tell Salvation Army officers, the clergy, by red epaulets on their uniforms and the lay members, soldiers, by blue epaulets. Salvation Army staff and volunteers are not necessarily affiliated or members of the Salvation Army Church. 
So for myself, even though I grew up in the Salvation Army and much of my early life was in the Salvation Army as a Salvationist, I am no longer a Salvationist. Uh, I am now Baptist. Uh, several reasons for that, but I still support as much as I can and endorse the Salvation Army's efforts. So as a volunteer, I'm not a member of the Salvation Army any longer. I will say the vast majority of Saturn members are not in the Salvation Army Church. There's a very small percentage that are, but they still support the Salvation Army's mission using ham radio and radio communications. Specifically to the Salvation Army's emergency disaster services, their primary mission is mass feeding, both fixed and mobile, and emotional and spiritual care. They do have secondary missions, such as a bulk distribution of goods, disaster social services, and long-term recovery. It is a scalable response, and I'm going to go from the bottom of this slide towards the top. If there's a local event, the local core, that local church, has control and will head the response. Divisional support may be there or they may uh, receive reinforcements coordinated by uh, divisional headquarters. If it's a multi-locality event, say several counties are affected, the division will coordinate and command that. Divisional events, of course, it scales up then. The divisional headquarters will have control and command of that response with territorial support. And of course, the largest event, uh, multi-divisional, that would be the territorial command and support, and uh, territorial headquarters would be in charge of that response. In its mission to support the Salvation Army in that scalability, Saturn, the Salvation Army Team Emergency Radio Network, utilizes amateur radio, UHF business band, mobile broadband kits, and Starlink. We like to view ourselves as communicators who happen to use radios rather than radio operators who happen to communicate. To that end, Saturn partners with the Hurricane WatchNet, Shares, and Mars. There is an international Saturn sideband net, which operates on 14.325 megahertz, which you may recognize from the Hurricane Watch Net, on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 10.30 a.m. Central Time. On Saturdays, the international net is on 14.320 megahertz at 10.30 a.m. There's also a national Saturn DMR net on Wednesdays at 7 p.m., then the Southern Territory, which will have primary response responsibility post-hurricane, and I'll explain that a bit more in just a little bit. But the Southern Territory, we have a training net sideband that we've been holding on the first and third Saturday at 9.30 Central Time on 7.268. Again, you'll recognize that from the Hurricane Watch Net. But we are looking to move that to evenings as that seems to work better for most of our stations. On a fifth Saturday, say there's a, a month that has five Saturdays, we do training via Zoom. The international sideband net, they partner with the Hurricane Watch Net, and in that, they will activate whenever the Hurricane Watch Net does, and they will provide weather and storm damage reports or help relay those reports, and then they're ready for any outbound health and welfare messages. The Southern Territory Saturn is a little different in the way we operate. Now, I will say that Southern Territory Saturn is grandfathered under International Saturn. So if you're a member of Southern Territory Saturn, you are a member of Saturn at large. We follow much the same prescription that the International Net does. However, we don't officially activate until immediately after the Hurricane Watch Net secures. If we were to deploy, we would deploy with these resources to support an IMAT team. We have not implemented that deployment strategy yet, but that's the way it would look in the upcoming hurricane season. Here are some numbers from last year. Hurricane Adalia, we had 110 and a half hours for all Saturn members. And the Southern Territory, we assumed the frequency immediately after Hurricane WatchNet secured, and that is our operating procedure. That is our protocol. The Southern Territory does not activate until the Hurricane WatchNet secures because there's not going to be much health and welfare traffic pre-landfall, but after landfall. And last season, we did implement that 
following landfall of Hurricane Adalia, and we were on for four hours, five Saturn stations uh, did monitor along with us with no messages. The members that you see in these categories, that's how many members were actually monitoring along with Hurricane WatchNet. And I will say that several of us are members of the Hurricane Watch Net. You can see the numbers there for Hurricane Lee and Hurricanes Norma and Tammy. Here are some of the points of contact for Saturn. You might be interested in these. Um, Michelle Heaver is the National Saturn Committee Chair. She's the liaison with National Headquarters. When I talked about the different territories uh, working independently to work together, they would coordinate through Michelle Heaver and that Saturn uh, National Saturn Committee. Of course, in the Southern Terry, there is uh, Bill Feast. Uh, you all know Bill well. And then myself, there is our information. The International Saturn Sideband Net, the net manager there is Dick Seeley. So in that cooperation on 14.325, Dick would be your primary point of contact. And on 7.268 as well. Dick is a member of Hurricane Watch Net as I am as well. Once again, thank you for allowing me to join you, even if virtually. Thanks and have a blessed day. It's our uh, Saturn video, and we thank um, we we thank Saturn for providing that. And um, Bill Feast sends his regrets for not being able to attend, as he's attended many of our uh, hurricane conferences in the past, and I suspect we will see him in New Orleans as well. So the next presentation uh, coming up here now is person I kind of briefly mentioned as I wrapped up my presentation, and that's KE5MHV, Josh Johnston, Director of Emergency Management. And I got his presentation queued up, and Josh, welcome aboard. Thanks, Rob. Good afternoon, and welcome to everyone. I'm glad to be here with you, Dan, in Orlando. Uh, had a bit of a, some of you may have seen, I had a bit of a trying day getting here yesterday, just some flight cancellations and that kind of thing, the kind of thing that happens to all of us. So, um, and Rob, ironically, it's, it's interesting that you showed that picture because one of the things that we have, the board of directors at ARL recognized several years ago is that for us to be effective in doing what we're trying to do and improve our role um, with ARIES and with, with our emergency response is this position needed to have the ability to make decisions um, and elevated this position from where Mike was to a direct position where I'm a direct report to the CEO. Um, that is a dedication that was shown um, and that was needed. I think something Mike would have liked to have had because I think Mike understood that need at, even when he was there. Um, he and I actually, Mike and I have actually uh, got a pretty good relationship. Um, we're working with FEMA Region 1, being that headquarters is in FEMA Region 1. Um, we're working with them as a support uh, alternate location for communica HF communications. Um, some of you may not know with ARL, we, we also are a uh, share station. How many of you are familiar with the shares uh, system and, and so we are actually one of the net, net control stations for shares and we monitor, monitor it as well as uh, um, emergency traffic, especially right now in region one, we're doing some, beginning some nets um, on 60 meters and some other stuff. So um, it's good to be working with, with our FEMA partners um, regionally, but then also the work we've been doing, and we'll talk about it just a second here in just a few seconds. Um, on the national level, um, things we've done uh, over, the, over the last two years. I've been at ARL now since uh, December of 21, the end of December 21, first of 22. And uh, we're trying to, uh, trying to improve on some things with our emergency preparedness program, our ARIES. Um, many of you are familiar with ARIES. Um, so in 2023, I'll jump right into it. This is not just hurricane related. Um, and these are not our total numbers. This is about half of the numbers that, um, this is what we get reported to us. Unfortunately, right now we're only getting about half uh, reporting to us um, at headquarters what their activity is. But as you see, when you ask, and people ask me, and we talked earlier, uh, the dinosaur comment, is amateur radio still relevant? Absolutely. Are we still involved? 
in the places that are doing things the right way, you absolutely, amateur radio is absolutely very much still involved. Um, when you can go and show over 687,000 hours, and I honestly, we had a mistake in our reporting, and I've estimated that down slightly, so that is an estimated number. I should have asterisked that. Um, but it's going to be very, very close. Um, what was actually reported was, was the, and I'm, I, I found it. I've got to get the actual corrected number. But uh, we're still in the neighborhood of $21 million um, in value. And that's based on FEMA's dollar value um, or through GSA's dollar value rate. And that's the hours just with, that doesn't count all the people that Bobby, if they're not, if it wasn't done with a, in cooperation with an ARIES group and they were participating in there, it doesn't count that group. It doesn't count all the people that are doing things with Saturn with, with VOIP unless they were doing it through ARIES. This is just what we captured with ARIES groups. Some of those hours may be captured in both places. Most of it is not. And that just tells you right there, we're capturing one area. And when we could talk about people participating with the, with the Hurricane Watch Net, with the VOIP Net, look at the value that we throw that we can that we can show our state, federal, and local partners um, that amateur radio has um, to this day in this country. Um, it's astronomical. I mentioned some of the things that that we're promoting and, and pushing for and working on doing and to, and uh, honestly working on getting better at. Um, one of the things that that I push and talk about is communications is key. <clears throat> Unfortunately, and I, any of you have heard me speak before, um, you've probably heard me say this. Sometimes as communicators, we're not always the best communicators. Um, the key to communications is in, a, in events like this right here. The relationships have to be built before the event. If you walk in, if, if I walked in and saw Julio at the Hurricane Center during an event, A, I'm not going to get in the door. And B, if I did get in the door, I'd be escorted back out on a very, very rapidly because I wasn't invited there. I didn't have a reason to be there, you know. But if you build those relationships ahead of time and they go, oh, hey, we've got something we need you to help us with, then you're going to probably get invited in if, if it's something that's beneficial to both. Same thing with the County Emergency Operations Center. If you're working with your county or local group and you're building relationships, ahead of an event and you're saying, hey, what can we do to help? One of the things I think sometimes we're really bad about is we're walking in saying, here's what I'm going to do to do for you. How about going into it with a, let's say, a servant's attitude and say, what do you need? They need Julio, they needed somebody to, that they needed a ham radio operator that could provide a radio. Okay, I can do that, you know. Building those relationships one at a time. One of the common things and, and one of the things that I, I iterate to everyone is regardless of what you're need, we need more information. Um, in the reporting that I just showed in the previous slide, we would like to have more information. The common struggle with all of us is getting the information we need. Um, Rob, you guys struggle with it even with thunderstorms um, in local situations. Bobby, I know you guys have, have had the same, same issues. Um, people. People being there, people being on the air, people listening. But how about get on and say, hey, the wind's blowing 45 miles an hour from the west right now. They may be expecting it to be blowing from the west, from the east at that location at that point. And you tell them the wind's blowing a different direction, it may change things for Julio in a hurry. Um, so the information sharing and the building relationships and the, and the knowing who to talk to and when is what's got to happen and we've got to do a better job as a community. I say this as a community, as a, as a, as a amateur radio community as a whole. We've got to, we've got to uh, work on building our relationships. Um, we're, we've, as I mentioned, are building our relationships with uh, Region 1. Um, and the share station that we've got. One of the biggest things that I started working on shortly after I came on board at ARL, thanks Rob, my klutzy fingers today. Um, shortly after I come on, came on board with ARL, I started working on um, coming on board with Safecom. Um, 
How many of you are familiar with SafeCom and what SafeCom is um, around the country? Um, so SafeCom is a group of leaders that was formed post 9-11 to develop communications plans and to, to develop uh, guidance for co communications. Um, it was formed by CISA, which, how many of you are familiar with CISA? Okay, CISA is actually the, the ESF2, or the Emergency Communications Lead Organization for the federal government. Most people think it's FEMA, it's really not, it's actually CISA. Um, this is a branch, is, the, is, the, is a voluntary committee, essentially, of CISA to develop guidance. The OXCOM course, how many of you heard, have heard of OXCOM or the OXCOM course? That's a CISA course that was developed in partnership with SAFECOM. So here's what was ironic about SAFECOM. Our SAFECOM actually had no one setting on SAFECOM at the time. There were some hams, but there was no organization. We did not have a seat at SAFECOM. And we were elected in 2023, in May of 23, to SAFECOM. Um, I now have been added to the um, Emergency Communications uh, Working Group, and uh, soon we'll be meeting for the first time with the uh, OXCOM uh, committee to begin talking about, you know, where does that course go going to be going over the next few years? Is it going to, you know, going to be any changes to that course or any, any updates or, or whatever? So it gives us a seat at the table to build those relationships and to have that communications. And that's what we're trying to do from the headquarters. We've started uh, quarterly uh, SEC top conference calls with all our section emergency coordinators. Um, simplified reporting system for monthly reports. One of the things that I have worked hard on is making it easier for our SECs around the country to report to us. Um, and we've created now, it's a completely online process, can be submitted and comes in. It makes it really easy um, to submit those reports now. Um, we're, we've been working with Rob and others with the National Weather Service on the Skywarn Recognition Day and looking forward to the 25th anniversary of that uh, Recognition Day this year in December. Um, and one of the big things, most, how many of you are part of ARIES or get our ARIES uh, letter? Um, Rick, who will be presenting after me here in a minute, um, Thank you, Rick, because he does a great job with that each month. Um, and uh, we really appreciate him and the work he does with that, as well as our uh, uh, Aries column each month in the, uh... now one thing I will say, because we've got a few folks on, got some folks online as well. Um, I think Rick would love, if you've got an article, got a submission, submit it to us. We can get it, we can get it. Rick's always looking for guest, guest articles people to write for him around the country. Um, uh, so, you know, get those to us. We'll take a look at them, may work with you or whatever, but get those to me or to Rick, or uh, you can send them to Aries at ARRL.org and get those to us and we'll, we'll uh, look at considering, consider including those. One of the things that we've just started, if you get the Aries letter, um, is we've just recently worked with NTS um, and the NTS group that's working trying to uh, improve the national traffic system and developed a monthly NTS letter. So any of you that are interested in traffic handling, um, that's something now that's available also. Um, biggest update thing that I've got to mention real quick before we get out of here is uh, we do have some new courses updating, updates to our courses going on. Um, just freshening up, and but we're going to change the look of it a little bit. Um, some may remember from many years ago, um, the way things were done several years ago, we had a level one, le you know, level two, level three uh, course. We're going back to a three level tier of courses, our basic, intermediate, and advanced. And they're going to coincide with our ARIES task book um, as a level one, level two, and level three um, the task book. Not 100%, but they're going to be, they're going to be much more closely aligned. Then we will also begin offering the ARIES leadership course. And uh, as I said, I, we're gonna uh, work on updating that task book to align with those 
the new course layouts as well. Um, again, it's about building relationships. It's about getting to know who your served agencies are, who your partners are, um, who in your community is willing to make a difference in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Is everyone going to be deployable to the point of they're going to respond to an emergency operations center? No, probably not. But can they provide assistance or provide information? As we've heard two different nets right here talk about it today, three different locations where you, when you listen to the hurricane center, what they're looking for. Can they provide that information sitting in their home without be, being deployed? Absolutely. Get out there, get involved, be radioactive and get on the air. That's all I've got. Um, and we'll, I'll be about available and around. So, uh, I thank you. Thank you, uh, for having me here. And I want to make sure Rick's got time because he's got it. If you haven't heard his situation, his story this year, it's a really interesting perspective um, on what, what he went through this year. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Josh. And just to mention, too, the shares license that the league has, that actually goes back to um, Dennis Durr at K2DCD who, who provided the license. So you could see the contributions from each person that's been in Josh's role. And, and we're thrilled that Josh is with us today in this role because he's done a, I think he's done a tremendous job. We've worked together on a number of different things. And I'm hoping to expand uh, some of that work with him here uh, over the coming year. And with that, we'll get into our final uh, presentation, and it's from uh, Rick Palm, K1CE, our ARL Aries Letter Editor, QST Public Service Columnist, going to talk about his personal experience with Hurricane Adalia. Rick? I'll keep this really brief. Um, uh, thanks for having me here this year. I've, I've lived in Florida for 25 years now, and you know, through the 2004 spate of hurricanes that crisscrossed the state then and many others since then, I've seen the projected tracks of hurricanes pointing to our state countless of times. Some were projected to hit our area, but always seemed to track away without much more than some rain and minor winds. So the truth be told, I had become inured to the possibility of real personal danger. Well, that perspective changed dramatically last August with Hurricane Adalia, which hit the big bend of Florida as a Category 4 hurricane, as we discussed earlier. We live in Columbia County, which was in the northeast quadrant of the storm, packing winds of 110 miles per hour. Um, is there a way to advance the uh, slide, Rob? Um, yeah, there's the either okay. page down or the uh, pa Page down? Okay. Yeah. It's right here, the down button. Down button right there. Okay. Is there a pointer around here too? Or? Yes. There okay. Is. That's the last button. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's the track of uh, Hurricane Adalia late last August. And that is a picture of Hurricane Adalia making the landfall there near Perry, as was discussed a little bit earlier. And um, we live. Um, we live right here, right there. Um, um, I never made it to uh, my Aries assignment at a town shelter. Instead, I hunkered down at home with my wife and five dogs. And we sat in our living room and watched a huge tree snap off and crush our two cars. Um, and we then realized that we were directly in harm's way. And we were gripped by and frozen with fear. Um, and I'll tell you, that is a, it's a horrible uh, feeling. Uh, during a lull in the storm and for the first time in more than 40 years of professional an amateur association with Julio and the operators at WX4 NHC at the National Hurricane Center and the venerable Hurricane Watch Net, I found myself checking into the net on battery power and filing a report on conditions on the ground. 
thank you, NET and station operators for being there for us. It was a huge morale booster, to say the least. Truth be told, much of our situation was due to my own failing to follow many standard, well-accepted recommendations due to stress. So where did I go wrong? First and foremost, we failed to evacuate to the town shelter, which was a scant four miles uh, away from our home, and is, it's hardened against such storms. And that decision put us in life-threatening danger, and I had possibly also let my Aries team and the shelter residents down by not being there. In the face of uh, danger, uh, psychological stressors, and the primordial survival instinct uh, cause a, a kind of a tunnel vision where uh, judgment and the ability to assess a situation more broadly and realistically are undermined. And denial is a powerful de defense mechanism that works against leaving home and hearth in any circumstance because no one believes that it can actually happen to them. And after years of, uh, years of recommending personal family and emergency communication plans and countless issues of QST and newsletter articles and so forth, we had virtually none of them. Um, upon checking into the Hurricane Watch Net, the net control station asked for my report on conditions on the ground and my measured meteorological data but I regrettably had no weather instruments to provide that data. So that was, our, that was the situation. On the positive side, since then, last month at the Orlando Hamcation, I bought a Pete Brothers Company anemometer, wind vane, rain measuring device, and installed them on an <coughs> antenna mast. A set of instruments to provide what could be critical information in future incidents. My new weather station costs about $300. Also on the positive side, my radio station is installed in a heavy steel 8 by 20 foot shipping container that has survived hurricane force winds and flying debris before. And also, I, I also had ample 12 to 13 volt battery power and a generator fully gassed up and ready to go. And those were the assets that enabled me to check into the hurricane watch net and provide that report for WX4 NHC operators. Uh, also, I was able to maintain communication with Columbia County Emergency Coordinator Brad Schwartz, N5CBP. Um, Columbia County, where we live, is a large, sparsely populated rural county. My colleagues in the county's Vital Areas program were busy. Uh, E.C. Schwartz was the lead in the County Emergency Operations Center, where Florida Governor Ram DeSantis spoke with EOC staffers and held a press conference just prior to the storm's arrival. In Columbia County, five shelters had a, held a total of 87 residents. Five ARIES members were dispatched to those shelters where they maintained uh, communications with Schwartz and other EOC amateur station operators. There were always two operators on duty at the EOC to cover shift assignments and provide redundancy. The EOC generator came on when the mains failed on site, providing emergency power for the amateur station and critical EOC functions. When link email was set up, when cell service between the special needs shelter and the EOC became unreliable, ARIES operators provided communication between sheltered staff and the Florida Department of Health Services, assisting in several matters. At the request of the Florida Division of Emergency Management, ARIES operators were able to establish communication with neighboring Suwannee County's EOC. And also at the request, ARIES operators were able to send a message to the neighboring Gilkes Gilchrist County Emergency Manager. SARNET, which we talked about a little bit earlier, uh, the statewide 70 centimeter repeater emergency communications network was available for communication with the state EOC from Columbia County. And two, H band, uh, two HF bands, 80 and 40 meters, were used for statewide communications. So the things we really need to work on in Columbia County is to have a uh, to try to develop more of an understanding of our EOC organization and functions. We also need to develop communication and relationships with other neighboring county EOCs and emergency coordinators. And lastly, and mostly, and most importantly for all of us, is the recruitment of additional ARIES operators 
And that is a major national ARL objective for this year. So anything any, any of you can do in that regard will be a big help. And uh, that's basically it. I'll go through the rest of these slides really quickly. Um, um, let's see. Am I pushing the wrong button here? Let's see. Page down, is it? Okay, I can't seem to get this to work. Oh, because this is... Oh. Okay, try to... Okay. All right, so that's back. Down here. So this was uh, that day. Um, that's our, there's two, actually two cars under that, uh, that huge tree that came down. Uh, uh, our pickup truck there under that same tree. And that's my new weather station on top of my uh, ham radio shack back there. It works really great. Another shot of the damage. That's my shipping container with my ham station housed in it. That worked really well. And uh, Josh mentioned the Oxcom course. Uh, Florida is now an Oxcom state, and there's more and more courses given to uh, uh, courses given for the emergency communi auxiliary communication certificate. So that's something you really might want to think about. It's really gaining traction here in uh, this state. Uh, would recommend that if you get a chance to do it. And it's the last slide. I just couldn't resist putting this one in. This was a, a presentation I gave 25 years ago at the National Hurricane Center at the best of uh, Julio. And uh, 25 years ago, it was just hard to believe, really. Um, one quick little anecdote, it's kind of funny. Um, I was standing up there talking, and my wife was in the uh, audience there, and I was just thinking to myself, uh, boy, she must be really impressed with me give, standing up there and on a podium that says Department of Commerce on the United States of America, you know, and I looked, I looked down at her, you know, for a prideful gaze, and she was like this. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we laughed about that for years. So, anyway, um, tried to keep this short here, and uh, that is our uh, great EC in Columbia County, Brad Schwartz. Excellent guy, really uh, ins inspiring, really uh, good to have him at the helm there. He's in the EOC amateur radio station there in uh, Lake City. And that's it. Thank you all for uh, serving Aries and uh, uh, the country with uh, hurricane communications. Special thanks to Julio. Uh, who I've known for 40 years, you know, going back a, a, lo a long, long way. So we've worked together on a lot of things. Thank you very much. All right, so that brings us to the end of the presentations. And now um, I'd like to ask the speakers to come up and uh, sit down, and we'll see if anybody has... Uh, uh, any questions uh, for the group, and uh, we'll go from there. We have one All right, we have one online already, says Jim. So, Julio, if you want to come up to the table here, there's a mic right there. Maybe just I can I can use this mic, and folks can um, can come up, and we can go through any questions. So you want to give the first question online, Jim, and then we'll ask the audience. All right, so the first question is for Josh. Can ARL work with repeater councils? Um, I, we can work with repeater councils in what regard, I guess would be my question. Back. Can you see the live chat for you? Yeah, I can get it going here. Is that there? There we go. Publication. Publication. Help or do you um, I would do this, and I'm going to enter this into a uh, 
I would suggest um, emailing me that question. I, I'm, I would like a little more background, a little more information. Um, er, email me at aries at arrl.org and I'll work with you and get you with the right people to see what we can do, to see what we can help you out with that. I entered it as Rob, but um, my, my, give me an e shoot me an email and we'll work with you to see what we can do on that. At email aries at arrl.org. Okay, so. and then there's a second question on there. I think this one's self-explanatory, Josh. They're asking about when the new training classes oh, would go online. The, the first, first set of them, at least the basic, will go live April 1st. Um, basic and intermediate may both go live April. Are, we're trying to make, but by the end of April, for sure, both basic and intermediate. Um, advanced will be another month or so after that and then um, um, go from there. All right, how about questions from the room? Any questions from folks in the room? Yes. appreciate Rick's uh, sharing his experience. Is that uh, documented anywhere that we can share with others? All right, is that documented? Just I'm repeating for um, other folks in the room and for the live stream. Um, the question was around uh, Rick Palm's presentation, is that documented anywhere else? I will say that it's recorded here in the live stream, so it's here, but also is there any other place where you've done that presentation? Yeah, that presentation was really um, elaborated on in a, in a QST public service column. Um, I just can't remember which issue it was. Um, it was this past year though, maybe, I don't know, somewhere around September, something like that. So there was a whole column and QST was devoted to that. So right, thank you. Tri thanks, thanks for the nice comment. All right, other questions from the room? Yes. How successful is Skywarn Recognition Day compared to the past years? So the question was, how successful is Skywarn Recognition Day compared to past years? So I'll give a couple comments there and others can chime in. I would say, you know, certainly during the pandemic, it was different. We had to do it all remotely. We did remote weather service office, call signs, et cetera. We, since coming back from the pandemic, I think it's worked yeah, I, more offices seem to get on the air in 23 versus 22. So I think it's coming back up the curve in terms of the actual NWS office participation. I think the overall participation has been relatively the, the, the same. Um, it'll be interesting because this is the 25th year. So we're looking to see if we can make that much of a greater deal about it. I think one other thing that's been different in the last couple of years of Sky One Recognition Day and then it's online and we've put it on our WX1BOX YouTube channel is actual videos from Ken Graham, the director of the entire weather service talking about Sky One Recognition Day, amateur radio, et cetera, coming from the highest levels of NWS to, to, to folks about what, what's going on with the event and how important Sky One is. So I think that's not happened. I've been doing Sky One for over 25 years haven't seen that happen um, from that level of the weather service in years. So that's definitely a positive. Now, I'll say this about Skyward Recognition Day and Skyward in general. It's still variable by office based on how well the amateur radio groups are, also based on how the weather service offices see things and see all the other technology. So the mileage kind of varies on kind of both ends. And what I'd like to see us do, and that's what we're working with Josh and the NWS on, is getting a new MOU together, maybe call it a memorandum of agreement, add a bit of wording around this, and also kind of work with the weather service to say, say, you know, there's a modernization of the mission. And it's not just relying on social media and these things, it's about relying on all the modes and having the trust built into everything that we're doing. And I think using the 25th anniversary, maybe getting this in place by that SRD would be really good. It'd be a good promotional aspect to maybe get it not only back to where it was before the pandemic, but hopefully, you know, further along and, and grow, and then also affect how Skyward is distributed across the country. You know, Josh, if you want to add anything to that. No, I, I, I know we're, we've actually talked about doing some more to promote and, and encourage, and not just Skyward Recognition Day, but others. But yeah, that's definitely, I, th I think, I think it, we have a potential if, if we'll spend a little time uh, promoting it 
this year, I think would be a good opportunity for a lot of things. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's time to start now. Yeah, it's time to, we, we need to do that now. Yeah, no, it needs to start now, and especially with the 25th anniversary, if we want to do some extra things, we have to get that in place earlier. We've talked about even, and I'm not promising this at this point, but we've, we're talking about maybe even some, I activated, we activated WX1AW um, this last year. Um, we may do something a little, a little more special this next year at headquarters. So. All right, other questions from the audience? We do have one online. All right, so now we'll hit the two. Yeah. We'll go back to the two online questions. Um, do you, so, do you want to just read them off, Josh? Yeah, the, first, the, the first one I can tell you uh, was uh, follow up on is the, are the, is the new courses going to be on the ARL Learning Center platform? Yes, all of the new ARL courses will be on the Learning Center platform. And we've had a third question come in. Are the previous ARL level one, level two, level three certifications still honored? They are still honored. Um, that doesn't mean that 20 years from now, they're still gonna be the most relevant courses. Um, very much so as FEMA does. Um, once new courses come out, they will be the, the current courses at some point in time. You know, we urge everyone to, you know, just refresh their training. Um, but as far as a time frame, we're not gonna say the current levels are, are irrelevant. Now the current re levels that are on there now will go away April 1st. Um, and the, Canva, the old Canvas learning site will be, will be sunsetting also. So that's all, of, I think all of those. The other question um, is, and I'll go ahead and read it since I've got it in front of me, um, is we used to have online trainings with Matt Foster from the WS uh, HNL, but then he seemed to have switched jobs and then Sky Warren Ham Coordinator resigned and since I haven't heard a thing from, in, since then I haven't heard a thing from NWS. Um, it's more, really more of a yeah, it's more of a, of a Honolulu question. Yeah. I know of a couple of other contacts there, and okay. so if that person, you know, if, you know, throw it, my email is katie1cy at arl.net, you know, is a quick one you can use. I can get offline and maybe talk with some of the other amateurs that I know out there about what, what's going on for Honolulu office. And that's another thing that happens. Staff changes, whether it's on the agency side or on the amateur radio Skywarn side, and that can make a big difference in in what's going on. So I, I understand his concerns, so we'll see what we can do with that offline. Other questions online or from the group? Okay. Let's get to the All right, I think that's it for questions. So for our online live stream people, I wanna thank them all for participating and we are so glad that it worked out so well this year. We think we now have the winning formula for the conference to continue this live stream availability going forward. So we're grateful for that. Thanks to all those folks to, that participated. We're now gonna go to the door prizes, which are just for folks here in the room. So uh, we appreciate everyone on the online live stream and the recording will be available immediately following uh, the live stream completion. So. Uh, it will be instantly available. So thank you to those folks and spread the word for those that couldn't make it today live that the recording is available and they can watch it at their leisure. So thank you to the folks online and hope everybody there has a great evening.